Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. To start off, my name is Marshall. I started my job as a park ranger a little around six months ago. I got this job fairly quickly because the other rangers quit ten months in. I thought it was very odd, but the pay was nice, and I've always loved nature and animals, so I thought this would be the right job for me. For the first two months, nothing really happened. It was the middle of summer, so besides the annoying, buzzing mosquitoes and the restless spiders that would somehow build a full spider web overnight around my jeep, everything was normal. On the third month was when things started to get weird. We've gotten reports of hikers gone missing without a trace and stories from campers who talk about hearing weird wailing deep in the woods at night. We thought it to be no more than just a few kids goofing off in the woods or hikers who just wandered off the trail eventually to be found later. But it wasn't that straightforward. It all took a turn for the worst when I got a call about another missing hiker. This time it was close by my cabin, so naturally I was selected to go check it out. I planned to walk about eight miles into the woods, so I packed the essentials and began my trek at 14. It was around the fourth mile I started to see what I had assumed happened. I found the tracks of the hiker butt. One mile behind him were tracks of what looked to be of a very large feline-like animal, except this thing's paw was bigger and wider than my foot, and I wear a size 17. I also noticed the impression it had left in the dirt. It barely left one at all. Not only was this thing big, it was stealthy. I walked around more, but I found that the beast tracks had disappeared. I looked around for more, but to my shock I found claw marks scaling up a very large tree. This is something that I have never encountered before. This thing was big, large, stealthy, and could scale a tree in one bound. From the looks of it, I was horrified to say the least, so I unpacked my hunting rifle, loaded around, and started walking again. Eventually, I came upon the hiker's body, and man, this thing was barely recognizable. I assumed it to be a male, no older than 26. It was shredded to ribbons. The arms and legs had been gnawed off sloppy, and he had deep claw marks from his collarbone to his pelvis. Through the gashes in his chest, I could see that some of his vital organs were missing. I couldn't even stomach to look at his face. His nose was gone, and his bottom jaw had been torn off. If he had any expression on his face before he went, I can 100% guarantee you that it was pain and fear. This person had suffered a death so gruesome that I couldn't even imagine how much pain he was in while his last breath escaped his body. I radioed dispatch and told him my location and decided to stick next to the body, just in case any predator tried to drag it off. Dispatch was about 45 minutes away from my location to collect the corpse, but it was getting dark and fast for those who haven't been in a forest before. The darkness is otherworldly compared to an area with few trees I wanted to stay with the body I really did, but about 10 minutes I heard a noise in the bushes, but when I turned I saw nothing. But that was when a drop came down on my head. I thought it was rain. But when I pulled out my flashlight to see what it was, it was, and it was crimson red blood. I pointed my shaking flashlight hand to the top of the trees, and my light landed right on it. I don't know what it was, but this thing was massive. It had the head of a lion without the mane, with blood around its mouth. The body of a tiger with a solid black body ripped like a professional athlete, but no stripes and the glowing yellow eyes that reflected its lust for blood of a panther, and the paws that would make a bear's paw look like minuscule. This thing had to be about six feet tall on all fours and about 340 pounds of solid muscle. It let out a roar that was a mix of a tiger and a jaguar, expect it was deeper and echoed throughout, while forest shaking me to the core and making my soul almost leave my body. I knew that no matter what God I prayed to it wouldn't help against this thing. This thing was primal, fierce, and from what I had to guess had been stalking this territory for decades. 
Right when it was about to pounce on me, the helicopter showed up with a spotlight and flashed it down on me. As fast as the beast appeared, it disappeared without a trace. I was so terrified by the experience, I blacked out on the spot. I woke up in my cabin with my boss next to me bedside. He asked me what happened, and I told him what I saw. As I was telling him my story, I saw a slight expression of fear on his face. But after my story, he told me I must have hallucinated the whole event due to the shock of seeing such gore and passed out due to the lack of an overactive imagination. He quickly changed the subject and told me to get some rest and gave me the rest of the week off. On the third month, nothing really happened, but I started to notice every time I went for expedition or my own hike, I would get the feeling of eyes watching me from the top of the trees or something following behind me matching my steps. I started carrying a desert eagle with me, but if it was the creature I'd seen last month, I knew it would be as effective as shooting it with a pellet gun. The next month on a Monday night, I woke to my radio buzzing. It was my boss. He had told me that he'd received a call from some campers who strayed to far into the forest and had started to hear wailing in the woods. I thought it to be kids just messing around, so I took the job and got in my job and was on my way. When I arrived to the campsite, it was a horror show. The tents looked to be destroyed by sheer force, and the camper's car looked to be destroyed by trauma that could only be accomplished by being T-boned by car going 90 in a school zone. But the worst part is I found the campers. Their body parts were all over the campsite and blood-stained every area. Knowing better this time, I bought a shotgun and loaded it with nothing but buckshot. I put my headlamp on and started searching the area for what could have caused such devastation in such a short amount of time. From my investigation, I found footprints of what looked to be of human origin. I followed them thinking that it would be a surviving camper, but as I followed them, they shifted from human to bear. I started to think that the survivor was mauled by a bear. I hurried my pace and I saw a man. I nearly yelled for him, but something stopped me. Instead, I took cover behind a tree, turned off my headlamp, and studied the man I found. He was illuminated by moonlight, but from what I could see, he was tall. Very tall, he looked to be about seven foot tall. He had long arms, long hair, and long legs. He had an athletic build. His hair was very long and dark, reaching to the middle of his back, and he wore a bearskin coat. He turned back somehow, knowing he was being studied, but by a blink of an eye, he missed me. He turned back around and started walking. I followed him, wanting to know if he was with the campers. He took about ten steps before something started happening to him. He doubled over on his hands and knees and sounded to be in pain. I wanted to rush over to help him, but before I could, he let out a otherworldly roar. He slowly shifted from human to a gigantic, monstrous bear. He looked to have grown to nine feet and sported a scar on his face. He was the size of a SUV and had red eyes that glowed in the night. Faster than anything I've ever seen, he took off deeper into the forest, running over tree as if he was a bulldozer running through cardboard. My hair was racing, and I was pale as the snow. I didn't move until it was sunrise, and then I booked it back to my cabin and notified my boss about what happened. I didn't tell him the part about the man-bear. Instead, I told him that a bear had mauled the campers. He accepted my report, and I sat on my bed the rest of the day, thinking about what I've gotten myself into. It's the sixth month, and it might be my last month alive. I'm in my cabin, all my furniture against my door, while an angry creature is trying to get in. I have nothing but my shotgun and a few rations to last me, but from the looks of it, I might not make it through the night. If I survive, I'll be sure to post more about my job, but for now, the thing at my door has broken through my dresser, and my couch won't hold it back for long. On October 6th, I found myself sitting across from Orion S., a man whose name had become synonymous with Bigfoot investigations. His story was one that had always intrigued me. 
and finally I had the chance to hear it firsthand. Ori's journey into the world of Bigfoot began quite unexpectedly 15 years ago. At the time, he was just an ordinary man with a love for the outdoors. He would often venture into the wilderness, exploring the upper Abaqua Basin near Silverton, Oregon. Little did he know that one such expedition would change his life forever. I remember it like it was yesterday, Ori began his eyes distant as he delved into the memories of that fateful day. I was hiking through the basin, just enjoying the solitude of nature when I stumbled upon these, these footprints. He described the footprints as being unusually large, unlike anything he'd seen before. They were deeply imprinted into the muddy terrain, suggesting the creature that left them was of considerable size and weight. Despite having no prior interest in Bigfoot, the peculiarity of these prints piqued his curiosity. I decided to follow the trail, he continued. It led me deeper into the canyon, far beyond where I'd ever ventured before. The further he followed the trail, the more isolated he became. The sounds of the forest grew quieter until all he could hear was the crunching of leaves under his boots and the occasional rustling of wildlife in the distance. And then I saw it, Ari said, his voice barely above a whisper as if he was still in awe of the memory. In a sunlit clearing, he came upon a sight that would forever be etched in his mind. A massive black ape-like creature was there, basking in the sunlight, oblivious to his presence. The wind gently flowed through its thick, dark hair, giving it an almost ethereal appearance. I was close enough to see it clearly, but far enough not to disturb it he recalled. It was peaceful, just sitting there enjoying the sun. It was. It was incredible. That encounter marked a turning point in Ori's life. From that day forward, he dedicated himself to understanding this elusive creature. He began studying every piece of Bigfoot lore he could find, tracking sightings and collecting evidence. His casual hikes turned into investigative expeditions as he followed the spoor closely, hoping to learn more about the creature he had encountered. Over the years, Ori has become a respected figure in the field of Bigfoot investigations. His dedication and passion for the subject have inspired many others to take an interest in the legend of Bigfoot. Despite the skepticism and ridicule he often faces, Ori remains steadfast in his pursuit of the truth. As our conversation came to an end, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at Ori's story, his encounter with the creature, his subsequent journey into the world of Bigfoot, all spoke of a man who dared to delve into the unknown, driven by curiosity and a desire to understand. As I left, I found myself looking back at Ori, a man whose life had been forever changed by a chance encounter. His story served as a reminder that sometimes the most extraordinary experiences come when we least expect them, forever altering the course of our lives. In the early 80s, four of us decided to take a trip down to the Snake River, which was about five miles from the town we lived in. This was in eastern Oregon, an area filled with lots of sagebrush and hills. It was at the beginning of winter, so there was only a slight amount of snow on the ground. We knew it was going to be a full moon that night and anticipated a spectacular view of the river. The group consisted of me, my husband, my sister, and her boyfriend. We were driving a 68 Mustang, feeling quite cool. We had some beer and weed, planning to just relax and enjoy the night. We headed out around 11 o'clock to a recreational area where people could camp and launch their boats. To get into the place, you have to leave the main road and drive on dirt and gravel dipping down toward the boat docks before looping onto the upper portion of the parking lot. Everything was going well. The moon lit things up enough that you could make out shapes around you. We had just parked the car and were talking. My husband lit up a joint and then passed it to me. We were in the front seats, my sister and her boyfriend in the back. Just as I was getting ready to take my hit, I saw something move out in front of the car, maybe 20 yards out. 
My first thought was that maybe it was a deer. I was turning to pass the joint back when I saw it moving to the right of the car. My sister knew something was up right away. She was about to ask what was wrong when she saw this thing moving toward the back of the car. Note that I had barely taken a hit. My sister didn't smoke or drink, and no one else had time to do so. All of us were sober. We both said, What is that? The guys asked what? And we said, Something is out there. They just started to laugh, but then they saw it moving around the left of the car. At that point, I got goosebumps all over my body, and I had a very bad feeling about the whole situation. This thing moved around to the front of the car again, but I noticed it was closer than before. At that point, I wanted to get out of there fast. Of course, I was totally spooked, and the guys wanted to know what it was. This thing had circled the car once more, and when it got in front of it again, my husband hit the headlights. Nothing. What the hell? It had been just right there a second before. When he hit the headlamp, it was on the right side of the car again, much closer than before. We just couldn't tell what it was. By this time, my sister, who was only 13, was freaking out, and so was I. We kept yelling for my husband to get us the F out of there. He must have been creeped out, too, because he started the car, slammed into reverse, and spun out of there backwards, heading for the loop so we could get back to the main road. We skidded around the loop, dropped down toward the boat docks, and began a slight climb up to the main road. We thought we were in the clear, but just then, the scariest thing I had ever experienced, up until that time in my life, happened. As we began to climb out at the edge of the headlights, but in plain view, a creature appeared. It stood upright like a person, but was extremely skinny and covered in long, kind of silvery brown hair. It turned when the headlight hit it, and we were so close we could see some pretty good detail. This thing looked directly into my eyes, and I swear it was giving me a good once, over, as if to memorize my face or something. Its eyes had dark pupils, and the look of them was like looking at a madman. Pure evil and insanity seemed to be the only things in them. As soon as this happened, which couldn't have been more than just a few seconds, my husband hit the gas and was aiming right for it. He said later he was trying to hit it. It then moved so fast it was almost a blur and was gone before it even got caught in the headlights. All I know is that we beat feet out of there as fast as we could. It was freezing outside and in the middle of nowhere. There were no homes, businesses, nothing. We couldn't figure out what we saw, but the only thing that came to mind was a werewolf. Many creepy things happened in that area and I refused to go there anymore. My sister, who was a veterinarian, my ex-girlfriend, and I had been on a road trip. After finishing dinner at the Sizzler in Bend, we decided to head south to find a spot to camp for the night. We were driving southwards and then turned west when we came across Kitson Springs. The place was deserted when we arrived. We quickly laid out our sleeping bags on the ground and settled down for the night. However, within ten minutes, we heard loud, rustling noises coming from the spring about twenty yards away. This was followed by a series of heavy stomping sounds, and then an eerie shrieking and howling that lasted for nearly twenty minutes. The sounds were reminiscent of the infamous Pew Yollop tape from 1974. Unfortunately, we couldn't see what was making these terrifying noises. The intensity of the sounds forced me to cover my ears, and seeing my companions panicking, I advised him to play dead, not that it was hard given how terrified we all were. I whispered to my sister, asking her if she thought it could be a cogger. She dismissed the idea as absurd, suggesting instead that the sound seemed more ape-like. Suddenly the creature took off at an incredible speed up the hillside, continuing to scream the entire way. We could still hear its shrieks echoing in the distance for another ten minutes or so. Somehow, amidst all this chaos, we managed to fall asleep. When we woke up the next morning, we were unsure of what exactly had transpired the previous night. I tried to look for tracks, but found none. My search was cut short as my sister threatened to leave without me if I didn't get back in the car immediately. 
how we managed to sleep after such a frightful experience, I'll never know. Okay, well, story still gives me chills when I think about it. I know I took LSD, but I swear this was no illusion. Or at least it did not feel like or seem like it. I've done LSD shrooms damn plenty of times. Me and my ex-wife were chilling in my old apartment in Arizona. It starts inside, then goes outside. We wanted a good night, and I had prepared Jack Daniels weed and one tab each of LSD. We drop the tabs at the house and smoke a bit. We then proceed to take a walk in the park nearby. We proceed to chill there for three hours. After that, we are feeling pretty sober again. We discussed and thought it would be a great idea to go to the river north of Mesa at about two, three in the morning. We take off, and once we arrive, we find a parking area next to the river. Once we pull in and we see two other cars parked but no people. Kind of weird, but we thought maybe they were camping somewhere. It's legit middle of the desert. We get out of the car, grab our bag of weed and jack, then proceed to walk towards the river. As we were walking, a man carrying a lunchbox walks right past. Doesn't look at us and doesn't respond to our hello. He legit just walks off into the desert into the darkness. We thought it was weird, but whatever. So there we are at about three in the morning, just chilling at the river, smoking away. Then I hear a baby crying and splashing noises. Mind you, this is probably five, six hours after dropping. I say nothing at first, thinking I'm still maybe tripping. The hairs on my skin raise up as I hear the sound again, and then my ex turns to me and says, You hear that too, right? Deaf! My stomach sinks that very moment in the crying. Sounds exactly like baby, not a mountain lion or bobcat. Gets louder and the splashing is louder. So I spring into action, thinking it's a child, and escort my ex to the car, give her the keys and lock the door. I pull out my sidearm. Gun is at the ready, not pointed, finger off trigger, of course, in case it's someone, the strange man, who is harming a child. I shine a flashlight and proceed to close in on the noise, as it has not stopped making noise. My heart is racing, but I move forward, calling out, Is anybody there? And the noise would stop every time I called out, but then start again. Baby crying and splashing in water. As soon as my flashlight lights gets close to lighting up the area that's making a noise, I see a dark figure, probably five feet or under, but a thicker build, hunched over the river and staring at me. Noise stops. Figure jumps in water. Loud, audible splashing, and then starts racing towards me down the river. I split, regroup with the X, and get out of Dodge. I highly doubt there was a child at all. At least I hope so. But that terrified me. I'm 100% that was no hallucination. But I did take LSD, anyways. Yeah, that's my scary story. I have had many things happen to me. I have seen a full-body shadow apparition, which turned out to be the so-called Hat Man, which I discovered by accident in another thread. I have seen objects move, sometimes two objects at the same time that are ten feet apart. I have had my locked door open and close on its own, which requires another thread to explain. There's a lot of details to it. I have captured over a dozen. Class A EVPs, some of which are the clearest you'll ever hear. I have recorded an ep of a person who told me his full name to find out he wasn't even dead yet but died two days later after the EVP, which proves we do have a soul that can travel out of our body. I have recorded spirit box sessions, and I understand the doubt in this, but it works. I have two of them that there are no denying that it answered directly. I have had things thrown at me, been laughed at sarcastically by a disembodied voice. I will post separate threads about all these experiences and go into detail. None of those things scared me. I even would say it out loud to the spirits, that they don't scare me. 
But one thing did scare me. Scared the crap out of me and will scare even a Navy SEAL in SEAL Team 6. I woke up out of a trance in front of my stove with the burner on and a knife with a plastic handle in the frying pan, the handle melting. I had no idea what happened. My girlfriend told me I called her and wasn't making sense. I had pieces of food in the freezer with knife slashes all over them, and the craziest thing of all had a room air cleaner balancing perfectly upside down in the bedroom, which is impossible to do. I tried it over a dozen times trying to stand it upside down, but it doesn't have the top surface where it is possible. I had no control of myself for over a half hour. I got possessed. I started thinking about how some murderer said they blacked out when savagely stabbing someone, or how someone who everyone thought was completely normal just lose it and commit mass murder for no reason. Now I wonder if they are speaking the truth and true. Evil does exist. What if my mother or someone else I love was there in the house with me that day? What would I have done? I think the spirits were trying to tell me that I should be scared. Me and my ex-boyfriend broke up about ten years ago. It was an extremely brief relationship that is usually not even worth mentioning if it weren't for our unusual living situation. When I moved in with him, we lost our lease because I was not on it, and the person that was moved out and decided to cause trouble because she's a jealous, cheating drama whore, I digress. So we had nowhere to go. Gabriel, no his real name, and I'm doing him a favor here since his real name is awful, and I get invited to move in with his brother in Alabama, rural Alabama. The sheriff was a very open clan member, it was the mayor, and everyone was very, very religious. I felt so unsafe, it was ridiculous. I did not know any of this before we moved. This is where I give you a quick profile of me. I grew up in New Jersey. I am well-read, not overly educated, but I know my stuff in a complete Scorpio. I was raised by a drug-addicted lesbian, a Jehovah's Witness knee witch, in the literal form, a Russian Jew, and I considered myself Jewish, and a Satanist red, temple of Set Not Levy, former Navy SEAL father. I felt like I was in a pit of vipers, and I did not know what Gabe and his big mouth told them, but they did not like me from the get-go. Their kids tormented me. One of the boys was stealing my brass and panties. Who steals granny panties? Gabe's sister-in-law did much the same, making jokes about my weight, which is hysterical because we were maybe 20 pounds apart. I was desperately trying to get out, and I was having a hard time finding somewhere I could crash. In the meanwhile, I was hiding in my room, not coming out even to go to the bathroom unless the house was empty. I spent most of my time sleeping, or trying to. I paid rent. I gave Gabe's sister-in-law all my diabetes stuff because she couldn't afford hers. I gave her all my CDs and movies to sell at their shitty store. On July 4th, it all came to a head. I am afraid of fireworks, so I elected not to take part in the local festivities that night, not just because of the fireworks, but because I ceased to have a real name, and I was either called Jersey or Yankee, and not in a friendly way. I'd fallen asleep. The house was empty. Things were peaceful, and then the rapid deployment unit of the 4th Cavalry from Texas showed up, Mighties and other large fireworks of undetermined origin were going off everywhere. On the window sills, outside the windows, on the porch, on the air conditioner. This resulted in the house being filled with smoke and the heavy smell of gunpowder. Small fires broke out the police or the clan. Showed up along with the fire department. These little monsters killed their own cat. I was outside in shorts and a nightshirt hysterical. The fire depth checked on me. But I was pretty much ignored. Oh, and my marvelous boyfriend, dead silent, the way he had been the entire time. I left the next day, thankfully, and that ended that. Gabe and I tried to be friends, but it didn't work out, and I moved on. It's been years since all that happened. I'm married. 
I have cats who are, are not on fire. I live in a place that's only slightly weird. I get an email this morning, a long one, to my old email address that I check like once a month. It was Gabe. His brother had had a serious stroke, and he'd recently gone to see them in Alabama. They had moved to a house down the street a bit and were renting out the house he and I lived in, or repeatedly renting it out. He told me after I left, and he left shortly thereafter. His sister-in-law and brother started having issues. About six months after we left, things started to break. The pool cracked, plumbing backed up, things like that. The house was in complete disrepair, and they were pigs, just absolute pigs who would throw food in the backyard, not like composting and who would leave wet clothing on the floor, until it molded, so none of this is really interesting. When the kids left, one got married, two went to prison, apparently. It was just the sister-in-law and the brother. The brother was staying most of the time out of state, where he was a pit boss in a casino, so the sister-in-law was alone. For Gabe, she started to see things out of the corner of her eye, and sometimes she'd hear music coming from the now empty room I stayed in. The she started to hear sobbing and crying and firecrackers and smell the flesh of burned animals and gunpowder. Finally, one night she said she heard noises and got up to investigate, and she said she saw me standing in the bedroom doorway with a look of pure hate on my face. She said I ran after her. Lol, I run for nothing. And then I was gone. They called in a minister. They should have called a rabbi Duke, but nothing worked. She, they rented out the house. No one stays for long. The pool breaks constantly. I did love their pool. They keep smelling strawberries. I used to, and sometimes still, wear a strawberry and champagne body spray, hearing music and seeing a light brown-haired cute fat chick walking around their house. So Gabe was emailing me, too. I am not a witch. I have dabbled in such things like five times. So yeah, not a hex. Not from me, anyway. I didn't respond because, well, what am I going to say? I did tell my father what happened a bit after everything happened. So I guess you never know. I've been wanting to share my stories or encounters for a while and finally decoded to. So, here you go. Feel free to let me know if you've had anything similar happen or just your thoughts. Growing up, I lived with my mother, father, and older brother. We had a two-story home. Nothing fancy or anything. As a kid, my room was directly in front of my parents' room, and I used to be scared of the dark so my dad would leave my door open and their door open. I could see their room from mine, and there was a table in the hall that had a lamp that he would keep on for me. My bed was against the back wall, and I sleep on my side, so I was always facing the hall. One night I remember waking up, and I was facing my door. I could see my parents' door was closed. I'm not sure what or how long I was staring out the hallway. This was almost 20 years ago. But I do vividly remember this dark, human-like figure standing at my door. It was full black, long arms, the fingers went past where knees would be, and it had this bright yellow eyes. It was nearly touching the top of my door frame, so it had to have been six foot or something. I don't know how tall doors are. I remember staring at it and it staring back, but I couldn't make out any other distinct figures besides its eyes. Even today, I will never sleep with my back, not against the wall, nor do I ever leave my door open for anything. Just a subconscious thing, I guess. Not long after this incident, my mother, who has always had mental illnesses, had a breakdown. I remember her running through the house, screaming that there were demon spirits and entities trying to harm me. She was later diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. Things had escalated to the point my father would sleep on my floor with my door locked because she would come into my room, pull me out of bed, and drive me to a church near our house and just sit in the car yelling at the voices coming from the radio. I digress, but I think this is just an interesting coincidence to not sleep paralysis, but kind of freaky.
A few years ago, I was sleeping, and I was dreaming. Ninety-nine of the time remember. My dreams, and they are all messed up in their own way, but I never had a dream like this before or since. In my dream, I was in the woods. It was foggy, and I couldn't figure out why or, or what I was doing there, but I had this overwhelming sense. I needed to run. So I did. I ran until I got the edge of the woods, and I could see my house in the distance. Now I live in a neighborhood, but in my dream, my house was the only one I could see. No streets, not lights, no cars, nothing. I ran into my house, and you know when you dream of someone you know things are different. But like you know where you are, just it doesn't look like it's supposed to. Does that make sense? Well, in this dream, everything looks exactly like it does when I'm awake. So I run upstairs, and I turn the corn from the stairs, and I'm standing in front of my door, which is right next to my dad's. For some reason, I stop and look at my dad's room. Used to be my mother's. They'd been divorced for two decades. And I could see a light on, in a shadow, like someone is standing behind it. Then I hear this voice in my head that just screams he's coming. So I yank open the door to my room, and I see myself sleeping in my bed. I jump into my body, and as soon as I do, I wake up. Three. Not my story, but my cousin, who used to live with us. We didn't have a spare room at the time, so we made a makeshift room downstairs next to the kitchen. There's a wall that separated the kitchen and his room. He told me one night he was laying in bed, listening to music, and he heard the fridge close. Assuming it was me or my brother, he called out our names, because it was late and no one answered. He then told me, after he called out a second time, he saw a boy poke his head around the corner and look at him. He didn't get a good look at who the boy was, but he said he had to have been less than five foot, and at the time my brother was in high school, and well over that height. He said it freaked him the F out. For some context, my cousin was in his late twenties at the time. Just got out of prison, six foot four, and built like a truck. He is not one to easily scare. 4. I was laying down one afternoon for a nap, and I had my dog laying next to me. I was sleeping on my back, and my head was turned toward the wall. I got this weird feeling my body was cold, and I just had this overwhelming fear. Now my eyes were closed, and for some reason I was afraid to open them. Even with them closed, I could make at this old lady's face staring at me. I couldn't see a body or anything, just face and hair, and she was inches away from my face. Now, it could have just been my imagination. I just remember the feeling too strongly. 5. As a child, we had a Dalmatian named Skip. Best dog I've ever had. Loyal, brave, smart, beautiful boy. One day I was home alone watching TV doing kid stuff. I was probably 14. Anyway, we were downstairs and he was asleep at my feet. Next thing I know, there's a loud crash upstairs, almost like a lamp fell over. Skip instantly sat up, started growling, and ran upstairs. He wasn't a PPD, but he was highly trained and overall good boy. Now my dad was a Navy SEAL and I've grown up around weapons and he taught me from a young age how to handle myself. So I grabbed the weapon that was on top of the fridge because my first thought was someone broke in. I ran upstairs and found Skip, hackles raised, growling and snarling in my room. I checked around. Nothing had fallen, no broken glass, lamps, etc. I went over to him and he was still motionless, just growling. I tried to call him to stop because at this point I was freaking out. A few moments later, I just left him upstairs, and I called my dad. Not long after I hear Skip whine and rush down the steps, he ran over to me on the couch, jumped up, and was shaking. Creepy. I have more stories, but it's late, and I don't know. I just felt like sharing this to you guys. What creepy shit has happened to you? So I decided, after perusing this wonderful little place, to share the occasions of hauntings and history of my childhood home. I guess I can start with what I've seen or smelled or heard. I'll rank them, not in chronological order, but in the order which comes to mind first. 
I noticed growing up that while in my early adolescence, late childhood, early prepubescent stage, there was more than often a smell of rotting meat and sulfur that would linger around the house. I always reported and complained to my mom and dad that I would experience these things in around the house. Now our home was very clean. My mother and grandmother, who alive at the time, were always busy scrubbing kitchen countertops, floors with that fabuloso smelling detergent and cleaning supply. You know, the one aisle of stores you walk by and your knees get weak because it smells so good. Well, anyway, our home was very clean. Waxed floors, clean windows, always open in the springtime, and Grandma liked her sheets hung in the April wind. I'll point out early on that our home was always tested and run up to code for radon carbon monoxide, CO2 exposure, and ultra-frequency emission. All things come back negative, and we're given a clean bill of health all the time which, looking back, baffled anyone and everyone to question. I never saw these, but literally all my siblings, my relatives and friends of my siblings, who would spend the night will gladly swear before judge and jury they witnessed these things. No soul mentioned here was mentally ill, abusing substances, or lying for notoriety. Shadow figures, a lot of shadow apparitions, and plenty of visible full-bodied apparitions. They carried with them the ability to manipulate the area around them. Some were identified as male, rarely female. Once my sister, older sister, was sleeping in an old room before I took over, before she left for college. She tells this to this day. She wakes up dead of night, pitch black save for the sliver of light creeping in from the lamp post outside. There is a figure nondescript bordering on the edge of the light and leaning back into the darkness. She said, its arm was reaching out, hand open and grabbing for me. Spooky? Well, there's more. Another occasion, she gets up and hears footsteps walking down the hall towards the kitchen. She hears the cabinet doors open and close where we keep the glasses and chinaware. She thinks nothing of it and decides to go get a drink. Upon entering the kitchen, she sees all cabinet doors wide open and there isn't a member of the family wake. I have heard footsteps and saw a door handle move. Some years back, I come home from school and I wanted to make a P, B, and J. So I'm standing at the counter when from behind me, I hear heavy, heavy footsteps slamming up the stairs. My first thought, so we're doing this now. I saw it. Saw the door handle jiggle like a hand was grasping around and twisting it. Never opened. I promptly make myself forget about it because despite being the size of grizzly bear, with the attitude of a teddy bear, I get scared of things very easily. Seriously, I've jumped at my own shadow before, several times. Back to the story. My younger sister comes home from college. Wasn't that far away, she drove to and from, and follows in my footstep and makes a Sammy. She hears it and sees it. The heavy footsteps, the door handle. She freak out because she's seen more stuff than I have and is more adept at the hauntings than I was. Backstory, I'm a devout Catholic, have been all my life, and will die one. My room at the time, and now looks like a chapel, which there is a reason for. My family has a theory that I wasn't screwed with as much was because I was the only one in the house with more than one crucifix in the room. So my brother comes home from work. We promptly tell him. Being former military and security forces, he gets his forty-five and does a sweep of the property. No sign of forced entry. Basement is empty and undefiled by supposed occupying creeps. Hopefully this small novel hasn't lost you. But wait, there's more. My brother has seen things levitate several times. Of course I call B.S. Who wouldn't? Nine or ten, there is always a logical explanation for things to occur. Hell, even exorcists are ardent skeptics. Anyways, he has seen his shoe fly across the room. He woke up one night to find his pillow standing stock still, seriously standing straight up. He's seen shadow apparitions and has heard his name whispered and called as have I. It's horrifying when it happens to you. There's more from him. I'll have to ask and write it down if you all want.
I witnessed with my own two eyes the door to my parents' bedroom swing, open and closed by itself, windows closed, no draft, no string. I saw it, and it still scares me. I've heard the multitude of whispers in my own home. Seriously, it sounded as if a whole party of people just decided to whisper, rock and have it out. My house, well, my whole family is old, school Catholic. When I say old school, I mean this. The modern world lost touch with the idea of the demonic long ago. The world has misinterpreted the signs. The demonic have actually increased, prompting the Vatican to release the Roman ritual of solemn exorcism to Protestant denominations. Think about what I just said. There are certain denominations who don't even have the belief in the diabolic or the rite of exorcism. Old school Catholics have the firm teachings of exorcist, light, meaning that all Catholics before Vatican II were basically little non-ordained exorcists running around. If you're curious, look up Catholic Deliverance Ministry. They're the grandchild of the olden ways. So I spoke of this to bring this point home. My sister, older, whom I love absolutely dearly, I would do anything for her in a heartbeat. She's my best friend. But she's an absolute window licker when it comes to this story. She and her window-licking friends used an Al-J board in the basement. Send in the priest. That house has been blessed a total of five times. Oh, don't get me wrong. It always was peaceful for long durations, until the activity just reappeared like a bad penny. Here I am, here to haunt. Part Break, Electric Boogaloo 2 I want to make this perfectly clear. In no way am I falsifying information or creating this for the purpose to have notoriety. This all happened in our lives and the lives of relatives and my siblings, friend. Have changed because of it. I do not believe in lying for the sake of fame or popularity. I have seen many others do this sort of thing and come to find they lied or completely made things up. So with that out of the way, let's get into this. Preface. I use language that can be devotional, which means passionate or emotional, because I view this part of my life deeply traumatic. Further backstory. I'm from Missouri, born and raised. Still live within the good old show, me state. As many people don't know who are historians or haven't lived past the age of 50 like my relatives, have explained to myself in my ripe old age of 21, Many suburbs and neighborhoods in Missouri were at one point heavy farmland and deciduous forests. Before MoDOT and the encroaching federal and local state government zoning commissions decided to carve through the karst topography in woodland to lay down I-270, I-95 and I-60, which are major interstate systems here in Mo. This was old country. With old and antiquated ways of living, my mom's father, who I'll name Grandpa Jay for the sake of privacy, had chosen the plot of land where my old home was to be built. This was, I believe, if memory serves me correctly, 1940. 1950, somewhere in that time frame. Well, it seems that in the childhoods of my relatives that the activity started almost immediately. I'll start with the one that still boggles me today and I really wish I knew more about. When the suburbs were built and life moved in, neighbors communed with each other and kids rode bikes in the streets until the lamppost turned on at dusk, was when disturbing reports of extraordinary activity were reported. In the front yard. Yeah, you heard that right. In the front yard. Well, the neighbors would complain to my Grandma Mary about the strange sights in the lawn outside the home. Strange apparitions, full-bodied and smoky, were seen strolling around like they paid the bills, like they worked on the railroad for a living, like my Grandpa did. Seriously, neighbors would report actually balls of light, spherical in shape, fly around the property, bright and incandescent in nature. Imagine a light bulb floating around. There you go. We've also seen our fair share of UFO sightings right above the house. 
This was a long ago. I was about eight or ten, somewhere around there. Sorry my spatial reasoning for age never really worked right. Anyway, it was my Aunt C's birthday, and my ma had decided to throw her a little shindig. They bought those awesome helium balloons you could tie action figures to and let fly away into the stratosphere. Anyone else? No. Come and don't let me be the only weird one here. Anyway, I remember begging to take just one of the balloons and let it free into the upper ionosphere, and hopefully the ISS would see it. Well, we know they pop when they get too high, and they just float back down. I'm getting way too off track here. Anyway, I run outside barefoot because in Missouri, middle-class families did not and still don't believe in shoes. Seriously, if I hear the tornado sirens go off, I'll be outside with a six, packed barefoot and staring up at the sky. So I run outside with my little helium-filled balloon and let it go. Let it go. I'm one with the wicked sky. Now, as a little boy, I'm looking up and laughing at the fact that balloons just float. Well, I see this strange movement above my neighbor's tree. I'll describe it as best I can. It had the general shape of a large triangle and was almost clear. I saw almost because it had a form of transparency to it, but the three sides that connected to vertices or lights were gray in color. It looked like it had a cloaking device. On the bottom, if that makes sense, there were three lights, as I described, that were brighter than the craft itself. I know it wasn't a B-2 stealth bomber because the shape was perfectly triangular. Like, perfect. So what do I do? I run on inside and start doing the courage, the cowardly dog gibberish. Eventually, my mom and my aunt are standing outside looking at this thing. I will remember that for as long as I am able. Still have dreams about it sometimes. Which, coincidentally, there was an old home video of my dad capturing some sort of Phoenix light scenario over the house. I wish I'm making this up. Trust me, I wish I had all those years of looking over shoulder and feeling watched redone. I'd give anything to be able to sleep without the covers over my head for once. I still peek around corners, and I refuse to be a dark room for more than a minute. My relative's childhood or parents. So I gave a little backstory on the house. When my mom and uncles and aunts were children, they would report the near same experiences, just without the demonic activity. My mom, when she was a little girl, they all shared bunk beds. She tells this story the same way after all these years. She wakes up in the middle of the night, feeling a presence. She turns over and opens her eyes. At the foot of the bed are an older man and an older woman dressed in antique clothing, full-bodied eyes wide, staring at her. Now, of course, these folks are not alive. My mom lets out this almighty cry, and she said they dissolved into a fine mist and just poof, like they were never there. As this is a multi-part story... I'll, of course, have new information throughout. My memory blocks a lot of this stuff out. But whatever you want to know, I'll write down. Grandpa, you see, Grandpa, Christ rest his soul. Before he passed, worked on the railroad as a switchman, and before that was a paratrooper in World War II for the 82nd Airborne Division, a job that requires superior agility and timing, and as a result, took a lot of energy from him. My grandpa was a tall scrapper of a man who loved nothing more than to come home with bloody scraped knuckles and tired eyes. This experience is told from my mom's POV. My ma tells it the same way still. They're sitting in the living room couch, pregnant with my sister. We had a linen closet in the hallway. Back then the doors were foldable and they were made out of cold rolled steel really heavy and guided on a track system. It was open and ready to be used for receiving the linens. I tell you that it's steel because my mom says to this day, with speed unmatched, the steel enamel-colored door folded and slammed shut. Kill my grandpa, whose bedroom was located four feet from his door. Grandpa and grandma's door slams open. An angry-looking Grandpa Jay strolls out bedraggled, who in the hell slammed the door. 
Now, Grandpa Jay didn't believe in anything extraordinary or supernatural of the sort. He pauses, and my mom said it. He looked at her and said, Why is it so cold in here? Make of it what you will. But no draft or wind could move those doors with any force required. It takes a hand or muscle movement to close those doors. My Uncle Jay experienced a lot of activity form what my mom has spoken of. The theory running around is that he was traumatized from it and refuses to believe or speak of what happened to him. I really wish he would open up. I mean, he was in the Navy, sailed on a destroyer around the Pacific, sailed through a typhoon, and still, still regales me about how awesome it was. My Aunt C, I'll get to her in Part 3. Don't worry. I'm seeing this through. The year 2000. My grandpa Kay, my mom's father-in-law, and my dad's dad was, before his passing, Christ rest his soul, a machinist and a police officer by trade. The house had a car port instead of the garages you see mainly in suburbs or local areas, held up by two large support beams made of sturdy wood and concrete. Well, the roof was sagging over the car. Port and Grandpa K jacked up the support beams to fix the roof. Now, to fix the support beams, you need to tear out the portion of driveway. We had a black asphalt driveway that looked like hell. So he rips up part of the asphalt and goes completely still and silent. He had uncovered a pine box. A child's pine box. In other words, a child's casket. He made my mom swear they would never rip the driveway or replace it, because if the EPA found out about said incident, they would tear the property in half looking for it and refuse to cover the damages. The child has been seen and heard by many, which will be covered in Part 3. One last experience before I have to get started on my day. 1990. My mom tells it as it is for the last ten years that I can remember. My Aunt M came over to visit, and she brought her newborn twin daughters, C and L, over so they can play or what not. They decided to set up the playpen in one of the spare rooms in the back of the house. Now, back in the day, baby bottles used to be made of silicate glass or some other compound, with a formula already pre-made. So my mom and Aunt M are chilling and talking shop in the kitchen. There is nothing to indicate anything had happened or sound to indicate an event had occurred. Something, a force kept nudging me mom's shoulder. An actual force or presence was touching her. All she knows, something was telling her, instinctively to check on the babies. So my mom gives in and goes down the hall. She says she cannot remember what drove her to check on the babies, but she walks in and the twins are covered in blood. Apparently, during playtime, they broke the glass bottles and the glass shards had cut them. My mom and aunt freaked out, and they go seal team six and take the babies. Come to find out, they only had nicks and cuts, but my mom swears, swears to this day, she thought they were murdered. That was how much blood there was. As stated before, this is a multi-part story. I have so much more to relay to the world about my experiences at that house. And because of it, to this day, I still look over my shoulder every now and then. Part 3 will be up shortly, and I hope you guys enjoy the moments that traumatized a literal generation. Edit, May 2nd, 2020, Part 3, Welcome Year Zero. So some folks wanted to hear the third and final addition to the saga of my childhood home's haunting or paranormal experiences. I am so sorry for the long wait. I had some work to see to, and now I can finally dole this out with respect. As stated earlier throughout this saga, this is not a work of fiction. The events described happened throughout and over a 50-year period, of which I wasn't alive for most of it. Only been alive for 21 years, lived there for 18. I will repeat this. This is absolutely not a work of fiction. It would be insulting to our family and a generation of folks who lived and experienced these activities to call them fake, debunked, or fictitious. Three of my siblings, and myself included, have suffered from various disorders and trauma due to the levels of fright 
Effects of negative entities and harmful experiences throughout our tenure at this previous location. The title, interestingly enough, refers to year zero when Anton LaVey established the Church of Satan's official year, I believe, in 1965 to mock in conflict with Christendom's after death, referring to the mystical resurrection in 33. I use this not as a comedic placeholder, but as a footnote to expound on this. This part deals with the demonic. I will relay experiences I have personally fought with and others have suffered for. A warning before I write. To recall these experiences brings me great discomfort and anxiety. I don't like to talk about it or write about it. I, for the sake of my comfort and your well-being, will include Pope Leo. Exegize prayer to St. Michael, instituted in 1886. Denomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. When I was child, I relayed this in an earlier edit. There was always the smell of rotten meat, sulfur, or human excrement present throughout my childhood home. It was pungent, prevalent, and always constant. This is a telltale sign, if scientific factors are excluded, a sign of the diabolic. It would always seem to waft around the house, even if the windows were open and the attic fan turned on. I could certainly never explain it, and it scared my mom to death, for she knew that what I tell you now. Since I am a devout Catholic, or as I jokingly call myself a Gothic's Catholic for my extensive love of medieval or traditional Christendom, we had statues of two saints, Blessed Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, and of the Blessed Mother. We also had two images of the Sacred Heart of Christ and the Immaculate Heart of Mary enthroned in our home. We had a statue of Saint Joseph that was repeatedly thrown across the living room by an unseen force. This happened multiple times. Never once was the statue of Mary ever touched. I was attacked by a demonic entity in middle school. Bear with me. I will struggle writing this. It was the week before Holy Week. Two days before Palm Sunday, on a Friday, 2011, 2012, it started innocently enough when I met a girl who was severely into the occult. It was rumored throughout our grade that she was an aspiring Satanist or practicing witch. She would routinely cut herself and offer the blood to dark powers. I met this girl once, one time. I remember her giving this look at me. It was scathing. I'll remember it for a long time to come. It was as if she packed as much animosity and disgust into one glare as possible. I don't remember her name, but I will remember what I went through after meeting her. Gothic Catholicism, Lesson 1. I don't mean to offend. Please forgive me if I do. This is what I have learned over the years. There are two types of Satanists, non-theistic and theistic. Non-theistic belief that Satan is man's ego, a representation of primal nature, the urge to be free and free within. Theistic, the worship and belief in the entity and biblical fallen angel, the fallen one, that old serpent, that ancient dragon who is chained in the abyss. Be sober and watch. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist ye, strong in faith, knowing that the same affliction befalls your brethren who are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little, will himself perfect you and confirm you and establish you. 1 Peter 5, 6, 10 first encyclical of St. Peter, the first pontiff. It is knowledge that one can cast malediction through an evil eye or a sharp glance filled with negative connotations, of which I believe I was the victim of. 
I'm not going into detail. Get that through now. I'm not doing it. I'll write down what I can. I was afflicted with blasphemous thoughts. Revolting and putrid imagery constantly filled my head. I found it difficult to pray. I had severe night terrors, too wretched to type down on this form. I sought relief desperately. I saw shadows, heard voices, and was oppressed. It happened on Friday at 3 a.m., the witching hour. I was awoken by an oppressive darkness, even though my TV was on. Nick at night was on. George Lopez. I heard the locutions of foulness in my head against God, Mary, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. I was never so frightened as when this happened. I grabbed a rosary, and I made a great sign of the cross, and I fought. I invoked the Trinity, Saint, Michael, Saint, Joseph, and the Blessed Mother. I wrestled with an invisible presence for hours into the early morning. I became angry, angry with whatever had the right invade my home, to say horrible things about the God I love, to speak awful things in my mind. I have no history of mental disorder. I am mentally healthy. I have never experienced anything else after this. The activity stopped after my little exorcism in the wee hours of the night. The voices ceased. In the... When my mother awoke and saw me as the good Lord as my witness, she told me that the sides of my hair had gone stark white. My face was gaunt, and I had absolutely no color to my skin. I promptly passed out on the couch and woke sometime in the late evening. Fast forward to Palm Sunday. I go with my Uncle Jay to see his best friend in the whole wide world, Father Jay, an Irish priest of the Jesuit order. I remember walking into the confessional and sitting across from him, to which he was surprised. I was always shy around others, and this brazen act of reaching out must have shocked him. I told him everything, didn't leave a thing out. He explained what I explained about Gothic's Catholicism and what I then fell in love with, spiritual warfare. He absolves me of my sins and blesses me right then and there. I leave the confessional elated and filled with hope. During the Mass, when we lifted our palm branches into the air before the crucifix, I felt as if my legs were to give out beneath me. I'm not ashamed to say this. I silently sobbed the whole time during Mass, trembling and sobbing out of pure peace and joy. The activity around me stopped that day. Not a single whisper of voice or smell was ever experienced again. I was given a blessed necklace of St. Michael, which I've never taken off in over a decade. Skip forward late high school. I was moving out of my room, and we had these old wooden doors with that thick varnish about them, you know. Well, I'm walking past it, and my eye catches something. On the door imprinted into the varnish was a face. I'm not talking pareidolia or seeing Jesus in a taco. I'm talking a real face. Eyebrows, eyelids, eyes, nose, lips, teeth, and a shape of a head. It was not in any way a human face, and it was expressing the visible sign of screaming. Eyes wide and mouth open and a silent scream. I wish I was making this up. I promise this is real. I swear to it to my dying day. Its expression was that of fear, like it saw something that made it howl with terror. Something powerful made it imprint itself on the wood. I always kept a crucifix above my door, oddly enough. I remember looking up at the crucifix and smiling. When we replaced the doors in the house with six-paneled white ones, I made sure I cut that old door in half and break it over my knee. I've been at peace ever since. If anything else, this is my testimony that evil exists in ways that man has no idea about. My oldest sister used an Owie J board in the basement, the window licker. Not the other one with a brain. Her and her window licking friends decided to use that piece of wicked wood and literally let all hell break loose. This was years ago when I was little. This is what started the darkness. Story time. So, they get together and do this activity, which I asked about not too recently. She reported feeling weird about it, but no noticeable events occurred during the session, like it's therapy or something. Time goes by and activity starts to pick up. 
Well, my oldest sister and her mush-head friends decided to do an EVP session or ghost hunt in the dead hours of night while our parents went someplace else. They caught the following. The voice of a little girl saying, He's here, and running away from the microphone, followed by a deep guttural growl before the tape shut off completely. My father is a retired police officer. He worked a tremendous amount of nights. There was an event where he came home, started stripping off his vest and gun belt. He walks into the bedroom where my mom was sleeping. To his utter shock, he sees the blacker shadow form of a male figure leering over my mother. Out of instinct, he racks the slide and chambers around, which in turn causes the figure to look up and promptly dissolve into fine shadow and literally disappear. I called B.S. to his face one day, was promptly told he wasn't joking and was corroborated by Mom. My Aunt C. was involved into the occult. She had witch friends and physic friends come over and cleanse the house all the time. It never worked, just made it worse. Well, one time, one of them backed up what we learned about the land on which it was built. We learned that the land previously belonged to a couple who had lost children. From what I'm told, an older man and older woman farmed the land before the subdivision, took up the land after they passed, to which they buried their child in a pine box, which I described in part I, electric boogaloo. The physic friend of my aunt comes in and immediately hits the nail on the head. Here's the thing. She was never told of the home. She was never told of the history or activity that happened. She didn't even know about my family until Aunt C. told her afterwards. I moved out after high school and never looked back. We sold the house to another family on the first day of showing it. They say the supernatural can't lure others into locations. I believe it. I just hope the folks who live there aren't as harassed as we were. This is all I can remember. I hope you all enjoyed our experiences. Thanks for reading. The room was dimly lit, the only sources of light coming from the small lamp on the psychologist's desk and the city lights filtering through the window. I sat across from Dr. Hoffman my navy seal cap clutched in my hands, my gaze fixed on the floor. It had been weeks since I returned from that mission, but the memories were still fresh in my mind, haunting me like a relentless ghost. Joel, I know this is difficult, but I need you to tell me everything that happened. Dr. Hoffman's voice was calm, reassuring. Taking a deep breath, I began recounting the events that had unfolded in the remote village between Serbia and Bulgaria. Our mission was straightforward, locate the intel on a Russian spy who had stolen plans for a new weapon and returned safely. We were a seasoned team, confident in our abilities to handle any situation. The chopper ride had been uneventful until we reached the dense woods of Serbia. A sudden malfunction caused our chopper to crash, leaving us stranded in unfamiliar territory. With our GPS and communication devices damaged, we had no choice but to rely on our training and use a compass to navigate towards the nearest village. Night had fallen by the time we reached the outskirts of the village. The darkness was suffocating, broken only by the faint glow of the moonlight filtering through the trees. That's when it happened, a guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. At first we dismissed it as the sounds of the wilderness, but then we heard it again, closer this time. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as we readied our weapons, scanning the darkness for any signs of movement. And then we saw it, a bipedal creature emerging from the shadows, its form resembling that of a massive dog but with an unsettlingly humanoid stance. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, reflecting our flashlight beams like beacons of dread. I could see the glint of its sharp claws as it bared its teeth in a menacing snarl. We opened fire, the shots echoing through the silent woods as we fought for our lives against these dogman creatures. They were fast, agile, and seemed to move with an otherworldly grace. It was a battle unlike anything I had experienced before, a primal struggle for survival in the heart of the wilderness. 
Somehow we managed to fend them off and escape deeper into the woods, using every ounce of our training to evade their relentless pursuit. Eventually we stumbled upon the village we were seeking, retrieved the vital intel, and made our way back to safety. But even now, as I sit here recounting the encounter, doubts gnaw at the edges of my mind. Did we truly encounter those bipedal dogmen, or was it just a trick of the darkness? A manifestation of our fears. I can't shake the feeling that something terrifying lurks in those Serbian woods, something that defies rational explanation. Dr. Hoffman listened attentively, nodding occasionally as I spoke. When I finally fell silent, he leaned forward, his expression thoughtful. Joel, what you experienced out there was undoubtedly traumatic, but it's important to remember that our minds can play tricks on us, especially in high-stress situations. We'll work through this together, and in time, the truth will become clearer. I nodded, grateful for his words of reassurance. But deep down, I knew that some secrets were meant to remain hidden in the shadows where even the bravest souls feared to tread. While my mother and I were grouse hunting up by Bina on Six Mile Lake Road in the Mud Goose Management Area, we both witnessed a Bigfoot. We were traveling down 20, 127 from east to west, and my mom said, Whoa, back up, down trail 20, 266 near the bend. We saw a Bigfoot off the trail in the grassy ditch, and it slowly moved off the trail west to east. My mom asked me if it felt like it moved in super slow motion. I concurred. The ditch at the site was three feet down the grass at the side of the trail, was three feet tall, and the upper torso was three, four feet above the grass, leaving the Bigfoot to be approximately eight, ten feet tall. We drove to the spot and both noticed a strong sulfur or rotting vegetation. When I got out of the car and immediately felt all my hair stand up on my body, I checked for any sign of footprints on the road. I could not see any due to the gravel being very packed down. There was a small bit of gravel disturbed in one spot near the west side of the road shoulder. We later got stopped by the local. Coal Conservation Officer, Ake Game Warden, checks on hunters. When we mentioned what we had seen and where it was, he remarked that's where people have been reported seeing a Bigfoot. My mother and I have no doubt that we saw one. This happened in 2011 when I was in training for Peace Corps service in Cape Town, South Africa. Most houses here have bars on the doors and windows and are surrounded by gates and fences. The village that I trained in was large and sprawling. My host family was wealthier than most, and while the house was nice, most neighbors had much simpler dwellings and tin shack. Our fence was tall and stable, with a thick wall of a gate in some of the neighboring fences were small barbed wire. The training schedule was packed, and I was usually gone all day every day. When I got home in the afternoons, I would often play with some neighborhood kids. Sundays were my only day off. One particular Sunday, towards the end of training, I was home alone. I was outside hanging laundry and noticed two small boys, about seven, eight or so, in the next yard staring at me. I'm white, and I'm used to this reaction. I'd never seen these kids before. I smiled at them and continued to hang my laundry. They continued to play and stare at me. My unease with these kids grew, and I thought it was because I was annoyed with being stared at. The longer they watched me, the more creeped out I felt. I looked up to notice that they were gone. I quickly went inside and locked the door. The gate was already locked, and there was a tall fence surrounding the property. I looked out the window of my bedroom a few minutes later to see one of the kids scaling the fence. I thought about going out there to say something, but felt compelled to stay inside and ignore them. The next time I looked, the kid had just landed in the yard, and somehow he saw me through the sliver of window I was peering out of and made eye contact. Then I noticed that this kid had eyes that were solid black. 
I felt like he was reaching into me and grabbing my insides. The kid prowled around the windows and door for a while. I don't know what happened to the other kid, but by that time I was totally creeped out. I moved to my permanent site shortly after that. All I know is that the encounter I experienced frightened me so much that even after all these years, it still shakes me up to think about it. Until that evening, I've always thought of werewolves as being nothing more than just fairy tales. But that first encounter has left a huge question mark inside of me. I come from a family of skeptics, so I decided not to tell anyone about what happened to me. Then one night, my brother came home trembling and pale. He told me about his experience, and I felt relieved that I wasn't the only one that seen something. It was after 10 p.m. on New Year's Eve in the late 1980s. We were living in a suburb of Tampa, Florida. It was either 1987 or 88. I was sitting out front of my parents' home, and instead of going out with my friends, I decided to stay home and celebrate the new year with my family. My father's car was parked in front of the house by the road, so I decided to sit on the hood, smoke a cigarette, and wait until midnight. The rest of my family was in the house celebrating. After about an hour, I heard a strange sound coming from the neighbor's yard across the street. It sounded as though a man was moaning in pain. The street and the property were dark, so I couldn't see much except for a small light that shined off in the distance on the back part of the property along a cinder block wall. The wall where the light was sitting wasn't finished yet. The whole property itself was wooded with trees and tall bushes. The bushes on the property stood around five feet high and over and around five feet in width. I kept looking in the direction of the sound to try and see what was causing it. My first thought was that maybe someone was hurt, but then the sound changed. It went from a moaning to a low-pitched gurgling, then growling. The next thing I heard was a loud thud as though something huge jumped and landed behind one of the bushes in the back part of the property. The sounds that followed were the sounds of something seriously heavy on all four legs, darting behind large bushes, moving towards me in a zigzag pattern. I started questioning myself as to what the heck this thing was. Was it a horse or a dog? It sounded so heavy and I could hear its breath when its feet hit the ground as it came closer. I heard the growling again, and it was like no dog I had ever heard. It was at this point that reality hit me, and I realized that this thing was coming towards me. I suddenly felt the rush of fear go right through me. It stopped behind a huge berry bush that was across the street from me, which was about 15 to 20 feet away. It suddenly became quiet, and I couldn't hear the breathing or the growling any more. I eased myself down off of the hood of the car because I didn't want to make any sudden movements, especially since it was so close. The front door was about 30 feet away from where I was, and I didn't know if I would make it. I didn't know what this thing was, and I didn't want to find out. I was so scared I could hardly breathe. My parents had a lot of bushes and trees in their front yard as well, so I noticed a gap in between a couple of them, and I started running. As soon as I started running, that thing started coming after me. I could hear it behind me as it came across the street. I heard its nails scraping the asphalt once or twice as it crossed onto our property. I was not about to look back, and as soon as I reached the front steps, I jumped to the top step and quickly ran into the house and locked the door. I was shaking so bad that I felt like I was going to pass out, even with the music playing inside the house. I heard the thing outside the front door growling, and then it went quiet. I heard another thud as though it jumped off the step onto the grass, and I couldn't hear it anymore. Suddenly I heard my brother, in-law speak over my shoulder, asking me what I was looking at. I jumped and thought I was going to choke on my own words. All I said to him was that whatever he did, do not go outside. He started smiling and said, Oak, oh, I guess he thought I was joking, but... Then he realized I wasn't. As soon as I took a couple steps away from the door, he opened the door and went outside to check, but didn't go down the steps. He quickly came back in and didn't say anything. I asked him if he saw anything, and he said there was nothing there. 
I didn't tell anyone about it, not even my brother-in-law. Later that night, around 12.30 a.m., after everything quieted down, I was in the kitchen drying dishes when I heard the most terrible snarling growl right outside the window where I was standing. I suddenly dropped the plate I was holding and it shattered on the floor. The fear crept back and I started trembling again, realizing that the thing was still outside, but it was along the side of the house towards the back and not the front. I backed away, staring at the window, but it was pitch black outside and I couldn't see anything. My mother came into the kitchen and complained about me dropping her plate. I still didn't say anything because I didn't think my family would believe me. I did tell my father that I thought I saw someone outside looking into the window. He grabbed his gun and went outside with my brother. In law and yell, trying to scare them away. It must have left after that because they didn't see anything. Until now, my sister was the only one who knew only part of my story. My story comes from the Crow Indian Reservation of Montana. I was dating a Crow tribal man at the time. I'm not sure how the subject came up, but he shared several experiences with me about his and his family's encounters with the Sasquatch people. When he and his brothers were little, they were playing in the woods when they saw some bushes rustling. They thought it was probably a skunk or a raccoon in the brush, and they started throwing rocks at it. He said suddenly an enormous Sasquatch stood up and yelled at them. It chased them and they ran home as fast as they could. Looking back as an adult, he said it could have caught them at any time, but only seemed to want to scare them away and back home. He joked it was rather like an elderly neighbor yelling at naughty kids to get off his lawn. He described it as about eight to nine feet tall and had white hair. He felt it was an elder. He said there were many sightings over the years, males and females in varieties of colors, but mostly brown and black. But there are a few gray and white. A brown female would often peek around a tree and look at the laundry on the line. She seemed curious. He said a fire came through the area and burned out the food sources that they ate. They moved on, and they haven't seen signs of them since. They also have many stories of the little people, and sometimes they are seen with the Sasquatch. Most of them will not talk about the little people, as it's considered disrespectful and bad luck. But there are stories of the little people helping the crow. I won't repeat those stories out of respect I have. Some of my crow and Cheyenne friends on the reservations have had many Sasquatch sightings and UFO sightings. Maybe I can convince some of them to email you their personal experiences. I wish I had more details, but that's all I can remember about his stories. My personal story happened near Nye, Montana. My friend and I wanted to pick the perfect spot after hiking in. We saw a wooded little island in the middle of the Stillwater River. It was so perfect, we waded out and set up our tent in a clearing in between the trees. We had a lovely night. We chatted away, cooked some great food, and went to sleep. I woke up in the morning to small pebbles hitting the side of the tent. Then something poked my side of the tent like a finger. It was close to the zip-up window, so I unzipped it a crack to see what was outside. There was absolutely nothing, yet something unseen continued to slowly poke the tent. I poked my finger to the outside, then it would poke. Then it poked the top of the tent. Then I poked the top of the tent. I was not afraid. I was just more curious as to what this invisible being was. I didn't feel any malevolence from it, more like it was just playing a fun little game. This went on for several minutes, and then it seemed to get bored and stop. When my friend woke up, I told her what had happened. We looked all around camp, and no clues, no prints, nothing disturbing. Just a beautiful Montana morning with an odd experience. I'm Irish and grew up on myths about fairies, giants, and other fey folk and Celtic legends. The fake or the unseen people can either be helpful and friendly or malicious, depending on how humans interact with them, by doing something that annoys them. They can be mischievous to outright dangerous. 
It makes me wonder if our ancestors actually knew the truth and we turned truth into mythology as we became civilized. I truly believe in the unseen people, not just the Sasquatch people, but probably many other beings. I have no idea what was poking my tent. I should have been able to see something. But all I could see was a tent fabric being poked by an invisible finger. I don't know what type of being it was, but it let me know it was there without showing itself. Maybe someday we'll find the truth about the other people, or the good folk, as the Irish affectionately called them. My friends and I were hiking back down a trail and didn't realize how dark it would get so quickly. We somehow got confused and took a wrong turn. I noticed an overturned shopping cart and said we went the wrong way. As we turned around to backtrack, we heard some rustling in the bushes. We had flashlights, but none that were that good or powerful. We shined the light, and all we could see was half of a stark white face peeking out at us from behind a tree. It looked like a mask, but it had no facial features other than eyes. We sprinted down the trail and back to our car. When we got to the car, there was an old dirty kid's doll on it. We jumped in the car and drove 500 miles per hour out of there and never spoke of it again. I was a teen and was heading back home late one night after hanging out at a friend's. My parents were gone and I would knock on my sister's window and she would let me in or leave the back porch light on and the door unlocked. I walked through a well-lit neighborhood and down an alleyway. As I was walking through the neighborhood, a little red car sped past me out of nowhere. I was a little alarmed but thought nothing of it. A few minutes later, I was jolted out of my skin when the same car drove by going so slow. I didn't hear it or notice it until it was right next to me. I ran away and went behind the house and the car sped off. I stayed there trying to collect my thoughts and figure out what to do. This was before cell phones were a thing. As I was calculating the quickest way to get home, the car comes back, driving on the wrong side of the road and stops at the curb a few houses away from where I am. An older man steps out of the car and is butt naked, holding a knife. He runs up and down the sidewalk, looking around, then stops and listens. After a minute, he lets out a scream that chills me to my core. Suddenly, a porch light comes on, and someone opens their front door. It was the house I was hiding at. I run to the door and burst into tears and tell the lady everything. The naked guy takes off, and the police come. I tell the police office what happened, and he doesn't believe me. Long story short, he thinks I'm just making it up, or seems annoyed by the situation or something. I got the F home and never, ever stayed out after that. I've posted on here before about something that happened a few years ago. Long story short, I was walking my dog at night when I saw in the forest, lit up by the orange street lamps, what looked like a deer standing up. But when I looked at its head, I couldn't understand its face. As in, its head or face was sort of shrouded in darkness, as if my mind couldn't comprehend what it was seeing. Strange, but explainable. Last night, years after that encounter, nothing strange had happened up to now. I was sleeping, my bedroom situated facing the road, with my windows open. I am normally a deep sleeper. But I woke up to the loud sound of bird noises. At first I thought nothing of it simply birds calling in the middle of the night. But over time, I noticed something. It's hard to describe, but it sounded as if about every five seconds or so, there would be a different bird call. And the calls weren't different sounds, as in certain birds make different pitched noises or hoot, etc. Instead, it was the same whistling noise. Not like a whistle blowing, but instead like the noise a songbird would sing but in different arrangements, for an hour straight. It was very loud, loud enough that I covered my head with two pillows and was still woken. It was just repeating the same fifty different calls or so in the same order. 
It was as if one type of bird was imitating the different calls it heard over and over in the same order. The noise was about 25 feet away, coming from the thicket next to my house. There was no sound but the calling noise. No crickets chirped, no frogs called. Hell, no cars drove through the neighborhood. I also faintly remember the smell of rotten eggs, but this may have been a trick my panicked mind played on me. Eventually it stopped and I fell back asleep, terrified. I had kept my eyes tight shut. I woke up again about 15 minutes later, hearing the sound seemingly further away, down the street, but again in the same exact order. Then later through the night I heard the noise again, either in the same spot as before and louder or right outside my window. I faced away from the window and kept my eyes shut, horrified but in such a tired state that I simply stayed put, not able to think of anything else. What the F was that? Does anyone have an explanation for this? I know my description may sound strange, but it's hard to put in words. All I know for sure was that it was not natural. This wasn't a bird or crickets or a frog, no. It was something else. I am an avid hiker in East Tennessee, and I have hiked most of the trails in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I've had many wild boar encounters. I'm not easily spooked, nor do I feel uneasy being alone in the woods, but I will admit that one incident left me feeling a bit weird. I was hiking a trail in the mountains near Tremont, Tennessee, in July of 2019. It was an unusually warm morning, and the wind was blowing. I could tell the storm was coming, but I thought I could get a 10-mile hike in before it got here. The trail I was hiking was steep, and there was a good-sized creek I would have to cross that was about knee-deep. I was keeping a close eye on the weather and making good time. At about three quarters of a mile from my turn, around point, I heard brush breaking above me on the side of the mountain. It sounded like more than one of something, or someone was walking, not running. I stopped to listen, but the wind picked up so I couldn't hear anything. When the wind died down, I heard brush breaking again. The side of the mountain was covered with rhododendron, so I couldn't see more than 30 yards up the mountainside. The wind picked up again, and I headed on thinking it was probably a bear, a hog, a deer, or maybe even a person. But by the time I reached the turn, around and started back down the trail, the weather was getting worse. When I reached the spot where I'd heard the brush breaking earlier, I heard what sounded like people talking gibberish. I thought, okay, it was people breaking brush on the mountainside. That's no big deal. I've heard this gibberish before, and most times I will eventually meet with a group of people somewhere on the trail. But as I came around the bend in the trail where my mind said I should have seen people, there was no one there. I stopped again to listen. The wind began to pick up, but I could faintly hear the gibberish. I waited a minute for the wind to die down, and when I did, I could hear the gibberish much clearer. It was like listening to a conversation that was just far enough away, not to be able to make out the words, but it was close enough that I felt like I should have been able to. I was puzzled. At the point where I turned around, there was an unmaintained trail that goes to an old fire tower site. I thought maybe someone had tried to follow it and gotten turned around. Most people go there in the winter months because it's so overgrown. I thought that maybe I should yell at them to let them know where the trail was. This entire time, the wind was gusting in my face. If I yelled at that point, no one would hear me anyway, so I, I waited for a break. When I could hear the gibberish again, I yelled, Hey, the second I did that the gibberish stopped. The distance I was covering was ten yards up and down the trail. I was facing up the mountainside with my right up the trail and my left down the trail. There was a small creek behind me that was little more than a trickle, and as soon as the gibberish stopped, I heard movement to my right up the mountainside. I moved in that direction looking up the hill. I was thinking I should bark like a dog. I've done this many times while hiking, and it has always successfully scared the crap out of people. As soon as I did, I heard something to my left. Something was coming through the tree canopy, and a rock landed in the creek behind me. 
I could hear more than one of whoever or whatever was moving above me. That rock made me mad, and I thought that these knuckleheads were throwing rocks at me. I moved down the trail to where the rock landed. The water was still muddy. I picked up the rock and threw it back, yelling, Stop throwing rocks at me. I was looking up the hillside to my right, near where I had just been. I heard a whistle, and I quickly ran back over to try to catch the culprit. The brush right above where I had just been standing exploded with a loud crash. I turned and ran back in that direction. As soon as I did something loud, crashed through the brush to my right and around the bend. From where I was, something had crossed the trail from the creek and was headed up the mountainside. I ran up the trail as fast as I could to try to see what it was, but I wasn't fast enough. I couldn't see any tracks, but the hillside was alive with activity. The brush was breaking like crazy, and I could tell it was moving. I've always thought that if I ever come across something I couldn't explain or see I would try and track it down, but that was not the case. I didn't want to follow this thing, nor could I have kept up with it if I had wanted to. I remember standing there thinking that I had just been played. I didn't know which way was up. For a moment something inside me said that I should move on down the trail. So I did, and from then on I didn't see anything. So I guess it could have been people, but I guess I'll never know. But whatever it was, it could whistle and throw rocks. Every time I'm hiking alone now and I hear the gibberish ahead of me, I think about that incident and I think to myself, here we go again. Then one day I was talking to an old timer who told me that the gibberish in rock throwing was the wild men, namely Bigfoot. I never wanted to believe in the phenomenon, and I had never seen any indication that Bigfoot existed previously. Now I'm not sure what to believe. How do I begin this? I think I saw a black-eyed child, and for those of you who don't know what they are, those are children who are very pale and they are usually between the ages of six and nineteen. They have very blonde hair, and they don't have any irises in their eyes. Their eyes are completely black. There's no white, all black. So I went online after this happened to me, and people have written stories about their experiences with meeting black-eyed children, and they say that one. They can't come into where you are unless you invite them in. They will usually pretend to be lost or need to use your phone or your bathroom to get into your house or your car or whatever. If you say no, then they can't come in. Secondly, nobody really has an explanation for what they are. Some people think that they are demons. Some people think that they're ghosts or aliens. Nobody really knows, so yeah. I had heard of them before I had this experience, but I really don't have any answers, even after I've had this experience. So my ride. I live in Pennsylvania. I work in Delaware, and my ride to work is this very long, winding farm road. At one point, I make a ride onto another farm road, and this road is a very, very tight space. It's two ways, so you can go one way in cars. We can go the opposite way. But it's a very, very tight space. So when you're driving the car beside you that's coming the opposite way, you both kind of have to slow down just to be safe. It's kind of a dangerous road. Now on each side of you are very, very tall grass hills. So if a cop was going to pull you over, I'm not really sure exactly where you'd pull off. You'd have to ride down the road for a while before you'd be able to pull over because it's that type of space and there's nowhere to pull over, really. So I'm driving this road on a Saturday. I had to be at work at 3 p.m. and it's around 2.30 p.m. I'm on this road, this very tight space, and cars are coming the opposite way, and I'm slowing down so that we can both pass safely. I look to my right, and there's a break in the hills, in the grass hills, where there's an entrance to a farm, and I look over, and in that entrance is a little boy. First of all, on Saturday it was 40 degrees, and he was not dressed like it was 40 degrees. He did not have a coat on, no hat, no scarf, no gloves, nothing. He had on a red and gray striped shirt and jeans. The way he was dressed and the way he looked, he didn't look like he was from this period. 
He looked like he was maybe from the 1950s. He was very, very pale, and he had very blonde hair, and he was staring. He was standing on his bike. He wasn't on his bike. His bike was to the right of him, and he's holding it, and he's stiff. He's stiff as a board, and at first I actually thought he was a statue. So anyway, he's standing there staring straight ahead, like his eyes are really big. He's staring straight ahead, and his eyes are black, like they're completely black, and I'm looking right in his face. He's not that far from me. He's maybe 50 feet away, and I'm looking right in his face, and he's just staring straight ahead and not moving. I was really creeped out by it, and then my window started to fog up, but only my window, my windshield, my back windshield, the passenger seat, or the back seats. None of them fogged up, only mine. I really don't believe in this stuff, like I don't think about strange phenomena. I don't read too much into it, whatever, so I know that this sounds crazy, but I promise you I'm not crazy, and this also isn't a trolling video like... I'm not putting this out there for attention or anything. I'm just putting it out there because I'm hoping someone has a logical explanation for what I saw. After all, like I said, I don't believe in this stuff, and I would hope that there is a logical explanation for this little boy. So I went to work, and I told a few people what had happened, and they were like, maybe it was a statue. I have to take that road home, so by the time I leave work, it's about 12.30 a.m., and... I'm driving on this road. This would be Sunday morning, and I'm driving very fast, even though the speed limit's only 35. I'm driving very fast because I do not want to be on this road, and I glance over very quickly, and at the gate to the entrance to the farm is, it's not closed. There's no little boy there. There's no statue, so he definitely was not a statue. I don't have an explanation for what he was. The thing is, though, if he was a real little boy, and maybe I'm imagining this, there's nowhere for him to ride that bike. I googled that road, thinking that maybe he was a ghost, and to see if a little boy had been killed there. The only thing I got was a man who had been killed there. He was a grown man, though. He had been hit by a car, but that's the thing. It's so dangerous for a pedestrian on that road. I work in a rather isolated park, and as a result, I'm given housing there. I used to live in the housing full time. Then life became busier. I found myself needing to be in the city more often, and so I moved some of my things into the guest room of my parents' house. Nowadays, I only stay in my cabin in the mountains one or two nights a week. It helps me cut down on my commute. I'm now reconsidering those nights, though. I'm still having a hard time believing I saw what I saw and heard what I heard. I've lived up there for four years now. There's a lot of wildlife up there, so sounds and movement in the night don't scare me much. I've gotten used to it, and thanks to the extreme light sensitivity I inherited from my mom's side of the family and my awesome headlamp. I kept from my ex-boyfriend, I can usually identify the things that go bump. I've gotten so comfortable with being alone with the wildlife, sometimes I even talk with them. If you sit still long enough, the sounds of the forest become louder and more distinct. With enough practice, you can imitate calls well enough to engage in conversation with owls and foxes. All it takes is some patience. I guess what I'm saying is, I'm very familiar with the local wildlife. It's my job to be familiar with them as a naturalist. I listen, watch, and wait more than the average human occupant of this park. I know it like the back of my hand. I can track most of the wildlife easily. Hike trails in the dark, and I'm well acquainted with my furry and feathery neighbors. This is why I'm so worried. We have a diverse array of carnivores and omnivores in our park, and if you've ever tried identifying scats, you know that anything that eats meat leaves a distinct-looking sort of poop behind. The foxes in my park prefer to hang around my cabin, and so I find a lot of their scat, and they bring me things, too, occasionally. Usually it's stuff like food and things they think are food. I have been brought dirty bandanas, all manners of food wrappers, and once they even brought me an unwrapped chocolate bar. 
first I started noticing the foxes were upset. They were crapping on the garbage can handled near my cabin. They tend to crap excessively when they're feeling especially territorial. But I've always been on pretty good terms with them, so I thought maybe they were upset they couldn't get to the garbage in the locking trash can. I emptied the garbage, but it continued. Then I started seeing sign I didn't recognize. The first of it fascinated me. I found it about a month ago. It was clearly the leavings of a large omnivore. It consisted of a lot of acorns, which oddly enough had the shells removed before ingestion. Most large omnivores in our area don't have the dexterity to shell an acorn, let alone the taste for it. They're full of tannins, which upset the digestive tract and taste awful. I thought perhaps it had just been really hungry, but as I poked around in the rather large pile, I found some small bones as well. The hunting should be good this time of year, and it was clearly able to hunt. As I watched the beetles clear the pile away over the next week, some larger bones made themselves apparent. They were about an inch or two in length apiece, and maybe one-third to half an inch in diameter, with a sort of tapered look to them, like they were pinched in the middle and flared at the ends. They had markings on them, which made me think they'd been chewed before they were eaten. Then I started hearing new sounds, and the foxes stopped visiting me. About three weeks ago, the foxes stopped showing up. I thought maybe their little family. There's five of them, a mom, another female, probably from a previous litter, and three kits that hang out. I have never seen Dad, but I don't think he sticks with them. We lost one of the kits last year when it was at its tiniest and most adorable stage of life to some kind of disease. I'm just glad the others survived. That weekend, both nights, I heard steps outside. I usually dismiss stuff like that as a possum or raccoon, or more frequently it would be a skunk, but these steps were distinctly bipedal sounding. I could tell it wasn't human, though. Humans make more noise than that. It would walk slowly, and I could hear small amounts of the dry brush crackling under its feet outside my window and then it would step on a branch and make a louder sound, and I would hear more rapid steps retreating. I pride myself on how well I've adjusted to being still and quiet in the forest. Most visitors can't even spot me if I'm three feet off trail observing, unless I say hello to them. Most humans are loud and oblivious to all the things that watch passively from the understory as they charge ahead, staring at the trail beneath their feet. That's how I know this wasn't a human, but I've got other proof, too. My bathroom and kitchen are not attached to my cabin. They are two separate buildings. I know it's weird, but I guess it was cheaper to build it the way it was built. Sometimes at night, if I have to take a piss, I'll just get up, trot outside naked, and squat by a tree if I feel lazy. Other times I'll don my boots and slog up to the bathroom. Well, that's what I did last week. As I walked to the bathroom, I could swear I heard other footsteps. Every time I stopped, so would they. It was like I had an echo. I stopped for a moment to let my eyes adjust to the dark. It was not a full moon, but a rather large moon last week, and the sky was pretty clear. So it didn't take long. It also didn't hurt that my power has been out, so there were no lights on to it with me. I looked around to see if I could find any animals nearby. I tried not to. Moved too much because I didn't want to scare it away if it was one of my foxes visiting me. It must have seen me searching because all I saw was a blur of movement not ten feet away from me as it disappeared into the deeply eroded creek bed beside the pathway. It was way too big to be a fox or even a puma, and way too fast to be a human. I didn't make a sound as I noped the F out of there and sprinted to the bathroom. I locked myself in there. The door is solid wood and stayed there till daylight. At least I didn't piss myself, although I came damn close. I took a note from the deer's book and went to ground, stayed as quiet as I could and didn't close my eyes for a second. I couldn't very well not come to work this weekend. It seemed kind of dumb once it was all over. I shrugged it off as being a trick of the shadows or maybe a buck that was up way later than deer usually are. Mind you, my power is still out, and it's been rainy and stormy all weekend. 
I don't know what the F happened last night. I don't know what it wants. I don't know if I want to go back. I was laying in bed playing on my laptop. I had the gas-powered generator running to charge my various electronics and run a small space heater since it was so damn cold and windy. When I heard a loud metallic bang from outside, I assumed the worst. I figured a tree branch had gotten blown down by the heavy wind onto my car, so I groaned and got out of bed. Then I remembered the weird shit from the beginning of the month and the weirder shit from last weekend, and I grabbed my Pulaski before opening the door. My poor Mama Fox. There she was, on my doorstep. My blood ran cold, and I felt like my stomach was suddenly full of adrenaline. There was a huge smear and splatter of blood halfway up my white door where she'd hit it. I didn't step foot out of my cabin. I couldn't think I was torn between rage, fear, disgust, shock, and confusion. Then I looked up and saw it. It was maybe eight feet away. My night vision is good, guys. I know what I saw. It was the size of a tall man, and it was covered in a fine layer of coarse hair. I can't make out colors very well at night time, so I can't be sure what color. Its eyes were dark. I couldn't see pupils. I didn't stand there looking at it for long, but I could tell it was gaunt and kind of man, shaped except its arms were long. I'm also pretty sure it's male. It is the single weirdest thing I've ever seen in my forest. I've learned since living here that things that act like prey quickly become it, so I lifted my Pulaski up above my head and screamed at it like you would at a puma. It didn't budge a inch, but it did talk. It only said one thing. Sister. And it said it in a whisper, a gruff tenor whisper. I once again noped the F out, slammed my door closed. This one is made out of metal through the dead bolt, pushed my whole arm wire up against the window, and cuddled with my Pulaski till the sun came up. All night I could hear the footsteps around my cabin. When I heard sounds on the outside walls, it took everything I had not to scream. It tried to get up to the roof. I have a skylight, so needless to say, I was waiting with more than just a little apprehension. I don't have internet or phone access up there, and it's isolated enough that I have no cell reception. The way we communicate out there is with radios and repeaters. I don't know what to do. I'm a woman of science, and so are all my other co-workers. I'd probably be laughed out of my job if I told them about what happened. I know I wasn't dreaming or seeing things because the fox was still there the next day, so I notified my co-workers about a dead animal. They told me to just kick her to the side or use a shovel, I decided. F that, and I buried her. I'm torn between anger and fear. This thing killed the mother that was providing for those kits needlessly. It didn't even eat her. I think it's hunting me. I'm by myself up there, too. I can bring the radio with me at night, but the response time for emergency crews to my area is around an hour. I don't know what to do. I don't want to let it kill any of the others. But what can I even do if I'm not safe either? Am I losing my mind? That it okay, so I think I have a plan. Tomorrow I'm going to go start the process of buying a gun. This is going to take at least ten days, inconvenient in this case, but I understand why the process is in place. So I'll take some other precautions. I'll see if I can borrow my neighbor's kangels. These are huge dogs, and if not, I'll see if I can invite my buddy up. I don't know if he'll believe me, but he's a dirty, horny son of a bitch, so I know he'll come up with me one way or another. I will tell one of our rangers that there's a predatory animal I don't recognize in my living area. If he blows it off, I'll tell our other ranger, Sir Per Insecure Power Abuser Mother F that I think an armed person is casing my place. I'll go up early on Friday and scatter some ash on the ground to see if I can get tracks. I won't stay. I'll go back to the city and get up early to go to work and stay Saturday night, hopefully with Kangles or my buddy. I've got my Pulaski, which I'm honestly way more comfortable with than I would be with a gun. I'll also have my grandpa's K-bar just in case. I'll sleep and go. 
clothes and keep a bucket for bathroom use in the cabin. I'll barricade my window. I can't barricade my skylight, can't make any modifications to my unit. It's a rental. But I can get up on the roof and throw a box over it so that no light comes out. I just got a call from maintenance not long ago saying my power is back on, so now it's a concern. They've been working on the power pole that got taken out for a while now. Management finally put the squeeze on them, and it's finally done. If I can't get Kangos or Boy Toy for companionship, I'll try to put together enough of those spike boards to put on the roof. I won't have to make as many of them that way, as that shit sounds labor-intensive. It's going to be a week till I have more for you, but I will update. Please let me know if you guys have any more ideas or theories. Part 2 So I came back up the mountain yesterday to prepare. Nothing seemed out of the norm. I saw no signs of life, though. No tracks or scat from the foxes or any other creature, for that matter. The blood from Mama Fox had washed off from the rain we got. There was barely a trace left when I got there. But I could still easily find the mound of turned soil from where I buried her. I sprinkled ash all around my cabin and the garbage cans with an old coffee can. I'd poked holes in the bottom of to work as a sieve, hoping I'd get some tracks. It was filthy work, and I was covered from hip to toe in gray by the time I was done. This morning upon getting here, I saw nothing in the ash. Nothing has visited my cabin at all. That in itself is strange. Even without the foxes visiting, I would have expected some raccoons or a skunk or even some of the larger nocturnal beetles, millipedes or centipedes. They're pretty ballsy creatures. Not everything in the park is lifeless, though. I went down to get a look at the creek after the rains. We haven't had many hikers recently. The weather keeps them away. However, the wildlife does gravitate towards the swollen creeks. I washed my hands in the creek just to feel how cold the water was, and looked up in time to catch a glimpse of two steel heads chasing each other to a gravelly deep spot. Hopefully they're off to make some babies. The rain came very late this year and hasn't been very heavy. The drought is killing us slowly. I wonder if the creature is at all related to this dramatic shift in weather patterns we've witnessed. The alders are beginning to sprout new leaves, and we have various different fungi popping up all over the place. It's certainly a good time of year to be an herbivore, but I'm not sure how long it will remain that way. We need rain badly, and if we don't get it, the herbivores will feel it first. After that, the carnivores will go hungry or have to find new food sources. The scavengers no doubt will do very well for themselves until the very end. I've initiated the process for buying a 12-gauge shotgun. The cheapest I could find was about $200. That's breaking the bank for me. On my lunch break, I visited my cabin to set up the cans and my other defense. I have two forks eight sheets of plywood. I put roughly 1,000 by three-pointed screws through them. I looked awfully weird driving up here with them strapped to the top of my car. I have a small 90 Civic. I put those on my roof at lunch. The idea is that the creature will make a lot of noise climbing up if it comes in contact with the cans. If that doesn't deter it, I'll at least be awake at that point, if I can even get to sleep. If it isn't deterred and continues up to the roof, the screws will make it impossible for it to make any further progress. I'll barricade my window again with my armoire and throw the deadbolt on my, thankfully, metal front door. On Thursday, I told our natural resources guy about thinking there was a large invasive predator stalking on my property. He sort of just shrugged it off, said it was probably a mountain lion, and told me to make sure to keep my window closed and not dally to long outside during sunset. I told our ranger, and he shrugged and told me to be careful. I was kind of expecting this, to be honest. So next step is to tell the paranoid ranger that I think there's a person stalking me. He's on shift tomorrow. Unfortunately, my neighbor does not want to let me dog sit. It's probably for the better, because I don't know that I can accommodate her extremely large and expensive dogs. My horny guy, 
friend got roped into a committed relationship between the last time I spoke with him and now, so he's spending Valentine's Day with his very pretty new girlfriend. Honestly, it feels like insult to injury, but I'll get over it. Which means tonight I'm alone, except for that thing. All I have with me is my Pulaski, my grandpa's K-bar, and a can of bear mace. Please keep me in your thoughts. I'm terrified. If I don't edit with another update by this time tomorrow, you'll know something happened. It's 12.30 p.m. here. Edit remembered a couple of other recommendations from last week and went back to put a box over my skylight and put salt around the perimeter of my room. I don't want to impact the soil outside my cabin, so I just trail the line of salt against the base of the wall all the way around my room and very thickly at the door. Edit update. Oh, God, it's not an animal. I don't know what it is, but I don't even think it's biological. I don't understand why I'm still alive. When I got off work last night, I immediately locked myself in my cabin and set up my barricade. I had a bucket for the bathroom and some cold pizza I had brought up from the city for dinner. I figured I would need some comfort food considering I'm about to start my period and, well, considering everything else. I didn't drink any beer, though, because I knew it would be important to keep my wits about me. I started hearing the steps around the cabin at about 8 p.m. The sun was well below the hills at this point. I lay very still and just listened. It grew very quiet after about 30 men of very light footsteps around my cabin. Suddenly, a loud and forceful blow to the side of my cabin shook the whole thing and caused my room to echo with the resulting bang. I couldn't help myself, and an impulsive gasp escaped my lips. If I hadn't known any better, I would have thought a large tree must have fallen nearby. Three more explosive blows rapidly followed, maybe a half a second apart from each. Other, on every side of my cabin. The first blow seemed to be on the wall to the right of the wall with my door. The second struck on the back wall that my window is on. The third was on the wall to the left of my door, and the fourth was on the door itself. Hiding under the covers doesn't make that shit go away, but I tried. I was trying to be as quiet as possible while I cried. The sound it made chilled my blood, gave me goosebumps all over, and turned my stomach into a walnut-sized knot. It was high-pitched, just like its whisper from last weekend. It was angry. The sound was a mixture between a howl and a scream and lasted for about ten seconds as it pounded twice more on my door, shaking my entire cabin. I then heard scrabbling against the door, and my doorknob made that small, metallic sound it always does when I touch it. That sound old, loose doorknobs always make. Then I heard the can. At first the cans jangled a bit. Then they really started rattling hard, and it made that god-awful sound again. I thought I was going to puke. When I heard a smack on my roof, it howled even more loudly. I felt relieved for a moment, thinking I'd wounded it with the screws and might even get some sort of DNA sample out of this. I then heard the board sliding around on the roof, and I nearly shut myself. I had anchored the boards together with a couple of chains and some screws and bolts. It wasn't attached to the roof, but they were attached to each other. I think that's the only thing that kept it from getting the boards off of my roof. I think it gave up and hopped back down to the ground with a grunt. That's what it sounded like from inside. I took the covers off of my head and let the snot and tears pour down my face for fear of making noise and trying to clean myself up. I heard the steps very faintly around my cabin again. Then they stopped and I heard a soft, meaty thump against the wall closest to my head. I don't know what it wants, but I know it definitely wants something. I don't think I want to know exactly what it is that it wants, though. I could hear it whisper in that creepy, raspy tenor again. It must have had its face pressed against the wall. Smell you. I didn't know what to do, but I remembered what one of you had said about talking to it. Since it clearly knew I was there, I gave up all precedent of trying to pretend I wasn't. What I said to it was, go away. I don't want you here. This is my territory. I'm armed. I tried to make my voice sound brave. 
Oh, Christ, the sound it made will haunt my nightmares for whatever small portion of life I have left. One word, but the terrifying part was the way it said. It want... I don't know that I can adequately portray the way it said it in text, but I'll try. It said it like this. Want... It started in that weird tenor, but by the time it hit the ah sound, it had slid downwards to a deep, bizarre, and horrible roar, like the sound it had made earlier, but deeper than any human vocal range I had ever heard, and loud enough to make my ears ring through the walls. In a frenzy of fear and rage, I lost my shit. I started screaming and pounding on the wall, yelling at it to go away. Go away. Go away. When I exhausted myself, I sat back on my bed with aching hands and covered in cold sweat. It was silent outside. I sat and waited and listened to the silence. I sat there for many hours. It was a little after 5 a.m. when I heard something slide up the wall of my cabin. It had been sitting there, waiting. It had waited till sunrise. I didn't leave my cabin until about 8 a.m., when I was completely sure it was long gone, I went outside to see the damage. There was soot everywhere. I'm not talking the ash I'd sprinkled on Friday. I'm talking black soot. There were huge splotches of it on my door, on my wall, and on the screws right above my door. The thing leaves soot behind. The soot smells like decomp, but it's definitely burnt black powdery residue. It also left some footprints behind. I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but just judging by these prints, I don't think this thing is from here or anywhere we even know of. I'll upload some pictures of the footprints today. I still don't know what to do, but I no longer think a gun is going to help me. What is it? What can I even do? This happened to me. Picture this. You're out in the middle of nowhere, miles away from the nearest population center. Just got done putting your fire out and are getting ready to go to sleep in your tent. The sun has been down for almost an hour. The whole time you've been at this location, you haven't seen any animals. Then as you are trying to sleep, you hear crunching leaves and footsteps around your campsite. You grab your air horn in case it's black bear. They scare off pretty easily, so it shouldn't be too hard. But you also have a can of bear mace just in case things get ugly. You slowly and quietly unzip a tiny part of your tent door so you can peek out. You see a silhouette, cast by the moonlight, of a human standing near where your fire was with what looks to be a rifle held in their hands. As you see them gently kick to ashy remains of your campfire spot, then looks around your sight and over your tent before just casually walking off slinging, the rifle or the shoulder. If you know a lot about animals, their actions can be mostly predictable, but people out in the middle of nowhere with a gun snooping around your spot, not even seven feet from you, that is more terrifying than any animal. I'd rather wake up to a grizzle snooping around my camp. I grew up in the desert on the outskirts of California. There was a shortcut that I would take that went through a giant patch of untouched desert to get home from school every day. One particular day, I was just walking through like normal, and this giant bush started shaking violently when I walked by it. I was understandably terrified. A creature appeared from the bush. It was a jackrabbit. It looked at me for two seconds and then quickly took off. The legit craziest thing I ever saw, though, was a stain-covered mattress that looked recently used. There was all kinds of drug paraphernalia, broken beer bottles, and used condoms scattered everywhere. I was leaving the area when I saw two sketchy-looking guys and a woman entering the shortcut. We missed each other by, like, five minutes. cruising through New Mexico near a town called Aztec. 
At the time, there was a highway called 666. No joke. Well, anyway, I'm driving about 80 miles per hour, and I look to my right, just checking things out. Like that he mirrors, make sure nothing is dragging. Well, I notice these red dots in the distance about 200 yards out. Well, what was weird was that it looked like they were running, like eyes with a body. Can't really explain it how I knew those eyes were attached to head attached to some bipedal body. Well, those red dots kept getting closer and closer to me. And no joke, there was this thing that looked human-like, but it was elongated and pale. But not pale white dead, but pale grayish, wearing some type of top hat with long hair and the most, most, most evil smile I've ever seen. My friend and I have never experienced something like this before in our entire lives. Recently, my mom had to go to an old high school friend's birthday party. It was convenient for us to go because a family friend has a farmhouse we could stay at in central Florida. My mom didn't feel comfortable going alone because the farmhouse can be really creepy at night due to the lack of light on the property and it just being in the middle of nowhere. So I told my mom I would go with her as long as I could bring a friend. We get to the property and it is a huge 52-acre plot of land with cows, horses, and open fields with a tree line surrounding the land. We looked on a map to see exactly where we were and saw we were right next to two Native American forests. We unpacked our stuff and were able to check all of the property out because the owner had a golf cart type of TV. My friend saw TikTok talking about skinwalkers and their Native American name, and we didn't know any better, so we were talking about them all day on all parts of the property. Later that night, we saw a video talking about how even saying their name could provoke them to come. We immediately got kind of scared because we found out the party my mom was going to would be an hour away, and we would be in the farmhouse at night all alone. As the sun started to set, we quickly noticed that none of the windows on all four walls of the house had curtains. With the lights on in the house, you could only see your reflection from the inside, but could see right in from the outside. As I said, the property had little to no light, but some floodlights were motion, activated on the back porch of the farmhouse. Just a quick description of the farmhouse, it was a one-bedroom one bathroom house with a little living room and a kitchen. There were two doors, one leading out to the fields in the back and the other was directly attached to the horse stables, which was more of a lounging area as there were tables and a bar with a giant flat screen. Okay, so now we can get into the scary part of the night. My friend was putting away our dinner in the fridge and I went outside to smoke. As soon as I walked up to the table in the horse stable, I heard something really close to me and ran back inside. As soon as I came back inside, my friend asked if I knocked on the window. Of course, I'd said no, but my friend found that hard to believe as she definitely heard a distinct knocking at the window. This window is important to the story because the floodlights were right outside of it. I forgot to mention we had brought our dog and she was fine the entire day until it became dark out. When my friend and I were both inside, we just brushed it off until a floodlight outside the window turned on and my dog bolted to see who was there. My dog sat there and barked at the window, but when we went to go check, there was nothing there. No both of us really needed a cigarette, so we both decided to go outside and give it one more try. My friend stepped outside and looked to her right. I was confused and told her we should stay in the stable, so we walked to a table. As soon as we sat down, there were another two knocks on the other side of the building. We got up and sprinted towards the house where we locked ourselves in, and where my friend told me she heard whispering coming from the right as soon as we stepped out of the house. At this point, we were really freaked out, and the dog had begun to start barking at the same window again, where the light turned on once again to nothing there. The only comfort we could get at this time was calling my friend's parents. In some of our friends, however, after a short ten minutes of us talking to people, our service cut out and both of our calls failed. 
We couldn't text anyone either, and this really scared us because we hadn't had a problem with our service the entire day. We once again tried to relax and put on a movie, but that's when we heard something jump on the roof and walk above the room we were in. My friend and I immediately leapt up and ran to the bathroom. We didn't know what to do, but at this point I thought our best bet was to run to the car, which was at least 40 feet away, and get off the property until my mom and the owner could come back. We grabbed our stuff, still hearing whatever was on the roof, walk around to where we moved in the house. As soon as we got to the door, my friend pushed me and said, Listen, which is when we heard two knocks right at the door we were standing in front of. It then ran towards the back of the house where all of the floodlights on the back porch went on. The dog was going crazy and my friend and I were on the verge of tears. I told her we had to run to the car and get out of there, which we did. As we were running, we could hear something on the roof of the stables, almost as if it was following us to the car. We sped off and sat at a parking lot two miles away for two hours until my mom and her friend returned to the property. They escorted us back in, and as we were all walking through the stables to get to the door of the house, there was another knocking in the stable. The owner said she heard it and went to go check what it was, but saw nothing. Something my friend and I had noticed was that the sounds of the crickets were back again. When we left the house earlier that night, there wasn't a sound that could be heard other than whatever was on the roof. My mom ended up sleeping there at the house, but my friend and I were traumatized. We felt as though the farmhouse was peaceful again as soon we got back because we didn't feel any of the negative energy we were feeling earlier that night. We were too scared to even sleep, so we both sat in the bathroom on the floor, apologizing for whatever we might have offended. We honestly don't know what this could have been, but we don't want this post to get taken down for it being framed as a question. We have come to a conclusion of our own on what it was but thought it would be interesting to hear other people's thoughts. So this happened a few nights ago on Saturday, August 28, 2021, in British Columbia, Canada. I'm not entirely sure if what I encountered was a skinwalker, but here goes. I live in a small to medium-sized town, not a large city in a suburban neighborhood that's situated close to the Fraser River. Everything around here is mostly woods, and there's also a large forest service road system, a few blocks away that goes quite far into the bush. A little bit more about my immediate area around my home. Sorry, it helps to understand where everything is. There's a little park across from my house with a small playground and a paved path that goes about 0.4 kilometers until it meets up with the main road. Down the hill from there, there's a newer housing development area that has a large cleared area, previously bush, and a long gravel path that leads to a meadow and eventually the road. If you walk to the bush at the park across from my house and take a ride in the woods, there's a narrow trail that's quite overgrown that pops you out at the start of the hill down to the new development. There's also quite a few trails within that section of bush at the park. About 100 meters away to the right of the hill is another park that connects to the Forest Service road system and endless bush. From the park across my house to the end of the meadow is about one 1.5 kilometer in total. The meadow connects to a large gravel area across from a high school up a hill, which is where this begins. All right, so here's what happened. This was all later at night, around 11.30 p.m. Me and my girlfriend were in the gravel lot in my cell. Across from the high school where we were talking and she eventually fell asleep as we had been walking around all day and the fair was in town. About 15 minutes after she was asleep, I started to get an eerie feeling like I was being watched and had a feeling like we had overstayed our welcome. I didn't like it at all and always trust my gut when I get feelings like that, so I started to wake up my girlfriend. Just as she was starting to wake up, I heard what sounded like someone shouting, kinda like a who or hi further away downhill into the meadow. I would have disregarded it but it caught me off guard a bit since it sounded almost doubled. 
like the person had a chorus pedal or pitch shifter on their voice. It spooked me a bit because of that, and I hadn't heard anyone yell like that before. I finished waking up my girlfriend, and we drove away from there into an elementary school parking lot down the road from the hill leading to the new development. I told her what happened, and we joked about it being spooky and whatnot. I then looked up videos to try and find something that matched what I had heard, and Skinwalker's screams or vocalizations were what matched up most. Unfortunately, I scrolled into the comments which mentioned that the further away the scream is, the closer it is to you. It spooked me for a moment, but chuck it all up to coincidence. For fun, we decided to drive down the hill to the new development as it's dark and spooky. It has woods on one side where the park is, and has a gravel turnaround for vehicles with a gate at the end where the gravel path starts. As we were going down the hill near the top, I got a very strange and uneasy feeling, almost like a slight panic, but it went away shortly after we got to the bottom of the hill. My girlfriend said she got the feeling as well, so we decided to turn around on a side street and leave. I decided to play some music that always helps take the scared feelings away from me, the Doom Eternal soundtrack, specifically Super Gore Nest, and put the pedal to the metal on the accelerator whilst going up the hill to make me feel more comfortable and like nothing could touch me. When we were about three quarters of the way up the hill, the feeling came back and hit us full force. The closer we got to the top where the trail comes out of, the stronger it got. The only way I can describe it is pure terror. It wasn't fear or dread, it was terror. We both had a physical reaction to it. We got intense chills and we could feel the goosebumps on our skin all over our body. We both started to get choked up and teary-eyed and I became short of breath for a minute. I must have gone from 60 kilometer an hour up the hill. Limit is 50 to 80 after cresting the hill and it felt like if we stopped we surely would have died. It was the most petrifying experience either of us have had. We didn't even see anything. I've driven past many animals at night, from deer to bear to coyotes, etc., and have been outside walking home alone at night with a bear going through garbage cans at my neighbor's houses. I've dirt biked past a mama bear with cubs and mama moose, and I thought those were scary experiences. No scary experience I've had from a car accident when I was young to almost being hit four times doing road construction from dumb drivers can even come close the feeling I had that night. The Doom soundtrack turned from the feeling of being a badass into feeling like I had it would be the anthem of my death. It was truly the most terrifying experience of my life. After getting out of Dodge, we went to a well-lit mall parking lot and calmed down for a bit, still shaking. I drove my girlfriend home and had a very anxiety and fear-ridden drive home. As the park across from my house connects only 150-ish meters away from where the encounter took place. When I got home, I made sure everything was locked up tight, had a little bit of weed to calm down, and then went to bed while on video call with my girlfriend. That night around 3.35 a.m., I woke up and had a mild return of the panic feeling for around five minutes before falling back asleep. I dreamt of the experience the entire night. The next morning, my girlfriend told me she heard tapping on my window at around 3 a.m., which made me shudder as my window is around nine feet off the ground. I don't know what to make of the experience and would appreciate some guidance into what this may have been. I've never liked walking in those woods alone, as I always get a creepy feeling, but I'm definitely not walking to my house alone at night ever again. We're going to go back and drive there at night again to see if it happens again. Not sure if that's a stupid idea, but my curiosity about cryptids and the like has been piqued, and I need to know what's lurking around here. Thanks for reading, and I'd appreciate any help or insight on what it may be. I was driving with my friend to his home in southern Arizona. We had to drive through several reservations, mostly had that I shouldn't look them in the eye or even pay attention. 
A couple hours into the drive, only me and my friend, who was driving, were awake. I saw a man dressed all in tan leather and wearing a large, wide-brimmed hat standing by the road. I didn't listen to what my friend said and looked at it directly. Every couple of miles, I saw this same man, always on the road, always looking at me. I got glimpses of his face sometimes. He appeared to have none. Eventually, I shut my eyes until we got to his town because I was afraid. I didn't see anything further while we stayed there. We go back to the West just about every year. The last time we went, we spent a night in a town in the mountains where his family had a cabin and we got stuck in the snow. We called a towing company and a single man came to help us out. We talked at length with him, or at least I did. I recall him being native with long black hair and wearing a tan suit, including an animal skin on his shoulders. No hat like the person I saw on the road. He was very friendly and wanted to eat dinner with us. We said no because we didn't have enough food for him and us. He offered to go buy us food and bring it back. We said no to this also. Recently, my friends and I were talking about this day. They didn't see a native man. They claimed that we were helped by a man with short blonde hair and a southern accent, that he was wearing snow gear and never asked to eat with us. My friend asked me if I had seen anything unusual somewhere else, and I told him about the man on the road. He told me that I saw a skinwalker and it was following me. I live on the East Coast, so he proposed that it only came looking for me when I was in the area. Since that encounter, I have almost constant dreams about. Going back to Arizona, what do you make about this encounter? Besides my one friend, no one else believes me. It creeps me out to this day. I went to Nevada a few weeks ago and had no incidents. We're supposed to go back to Arizona in the winter. I'm a little nervous. Hello, this is the story of how I quit my job. This isn't a liberating story of breaking the shackles and going to my dream job. This is a story of leaving a demonic place. I am a park ranger. It all goes back to one week ago. I was in my truck taking the usual route around the park until I saw a white van. It wasn't even on the trail. It was just sitting there in the middle of the forest. I called in a 1092 illegally parked vehicle until my radio went off 10. 4. Permission to investigate. I exited my truck and walked toward the van. The environment was completely silent, except for my engine still running and my footsteps, which seemed ever so loud. I walked around the van. Nothing seemed odd till I got to the other side of the van. I saw a black pentagram spray-painted on the van. I started to notice that there were scuff marks and little blemishes here and there. I was walking back to my vehicle to call in tow when I heard a roar. It didn't sound like a bear. It sounded like something more demonic. I walked toward the source of the sound. I walked past the van and walked flashlight in hand. I heard its violent cries again. I pulled my gun out and stood frozen. I heard footsteps zoom behind me. I turned around to see nothing. I blew a sigh of relief, knowing it was all probably in my head. I walked back to my car and called in a tow truck. I looked out into the forest. I noticed two red eyes staring back at me. I blinked and they were gone. I thought it had to be in my head. It had to. There's no such thing as monsters repeating in my brain like a broken record. Eventually, the tow truck pulled up. The man got out and I got out of my car too. You look worse for wear, the tow man said. Lack of sleep, I said. That was somewhat true. I was too embarrassed to say I was terrified. Eventually, we hooked up the van, and that was that. I got in my truck and drove off. That was the end of it, or that's what I thought. After getting a few complaints and other issues, I started to relax again. The only thing that bothered me was I felt like I was being watched. Eventually, I came up to a downed tree blocking the path. I checked my GPS and called in. We have a 1053 at J28 Southeast. Then I heard 1012. We are sending assistance. As I got out of my car, I walked towards the fallen tree. 
I tried to push it to see if I could make some progress. Well, I waited for backup. It was useless. I kicked it in frustration. Then I heard it. Not again, I thought. My heart was racing. Snap! A twig snapped, and I instantly turned around. It was tall and muscular. I raised my flashlight and saw its face. Oh, God, the face! It had long goat horns and the face of a goat with dark red eyes. Those eyes. It, it had been following me. I was face to face with a goat man. I dropped my flashlight and ran with a gun in hand. I ran, but I could hear this thing getting closer. I knew it would catch me, so I turned around and fired off a few shots. That seemed to scare it. I looked and managed to get a headshot, yet I still stood. It looked at me and fled into the distance. I ignored the 1053 and got into my car and drove off. I went to one of the ranger centers and reported it in. Apparently, there's been multiple reports. There have been multiple reports, and they did nothing. I turned in my badge at that moment. I'm haunted by that thing. Its eyes still appear in my nightmares. After six dedicated years of working there, I quit. I regret it a bit, but I hope I never see the goat man again. Last night I fell asleep to the sounds of birds that I do not normally hear around here. I live in Virginia near the Blue Ridge in a small town. I have a good amount of woods outside of my house and some pretty quiet neighbors aside from their children. The birds sounded different last night and I think it might be a migration or something causing it, but they sounded unlike any bird to come through my area before. So I thought I might add that as a strange factor. This morning, like most mornings, I woke up and went outside to feel the ground on my feet and look for any cool mushrooms that appear in the moss overnight. Today, there were none. I am outside right now, listening to get a better description. First, I heard what I would describe as possibly a baby fox instead of short cries, though. It was more of a very long, hollow wail. This didn't bother me much. The other noise first started when I walked back up the steps to the porch. I promise I'm being honest, it was like three big farts. It was very close to me when I walked to the door, so close that I didn't want to stay and listen. Now it sounds like it's getting further away. I would describe it as a low-pitched, raspy moan. That's probably all for now. I can't hear it anymore. But I thought it was interesting, and I have never heard anything like that before. I'll update if it actually turns out to be something strange. On August 27, 2016, my 10-year-old grandson was sitting in a car at a restaurant parking lot, waiting for his paternal grandmother across the street on a sidewalk. He noticed a large creature, which, from talking with him, I determined to be seven to eight feet tall. It was walking on two legs toward a wooded area at the end of a sidewalk and disappeared into some brush. The creature did not appear concerned about my grandson, as it was in no hurry. When I asked him about what he had seen, he described a classic canine-type dog man with red eyes. His distance from the creature was approximately thirty feet. Dolly's city is semi-rural with many pockets of woodlands and some tracts of forest. The area where he saw the creature has paved roads and sidewalks lined with areas of trees. This is a true story and I've been kind of obsessing over what happened out there. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible without leaving out key details. I grew up deep in the mountains of Shoshone County, an hour from a grocery store. The wilderness is my peace and my home, but these woods, they are evil, and I never should came to Washington. My wife's uncle, Jay, bought some land just north of Spokane, Washington with a friend of the family, Kay. They got it at a significant discount because a nearby aluminum smelter had polluted the ground, and it was impossible to use the water beneath the ground. They'd set up two plots, and each had a camper to live in. 
Gay had been progressively getting paranoid in saying people were stalking him and watching him in the trees. About three months into living there, a man wandering through the woods, they had an interaction with Jay and ended up attacking him and breaking his jaw. Upon being arrested, the man said he was overcome with a desire to see if he could kill him with a single punch. Two months later, Jay was murdered in his sleep on the couch in his camper. Kay found him and immediately ran as far away until he stopped to call the police. There was sufficient evidence of who did it and they quickly caught the killer, who was a 19-year-old boy, who said he simply wanted his bike. He beat him to death with a power tool that was lying on the floor nearby, completely bashed his brains in. Kay was completely terrified at all times to be there alone. He had moved in with a family member until eight months later he ended up with nowhere else to go and had to return. In constant fear, he finally convinced my pregnant wife and... I had to come stay with him. The second I turned off the highway onto the property, I was overcame with dread. There were at least 250 crows covering the dirt road up to the property. I didn't sleep whatsoever the first night. I stared into the forest, searching for the cause of my intense fear. The energy of this place was so uncomfortable, and I assumed it was simply just knowing Uncle Jay was killed here. Even the days were eerie. Never did I have a moment where I didn't feel watched here. My wife and I always had the sense of fear, especially after dark. Things sort of normalized for a while until one day Kay began puking and feeling very lightheaded all the time. I took him to the hospital and they said he was fine, probably a flu. At this point it was the anniversary of Jay's murder. Three days after the date of Jay's death, Kay comes running out of his camper screaming, I can't breathe. Waking my wife and I up and we run out to see what's wrong. Kay had gotten into his car and floored it crashing into a nearby tree. I run up and peer through the window to see the most intense and most primal fear I've ever seen in someone's eyes. He was gasping and clutching his chest. Moments later he breathed out one last time and he was dead. We gave him P-Par for 30 minutes until M's arrived. On July 10th, one year and three days after moving there with Jay and they were both dead. Now it's only me and the wife alone on the property, every moment living in fear and not understanding what had happened here. I don't know why we didn't leave right away. One day I come out to get fresh water from a drum. We kept for water to smell the worst smell I'd ever smelled. The water container had a one-inch opening on top, and inside the water was bits and pieces of chipmunks, like spines and heads. They didn't fall in. Something ripped them apart before putting them inside. The nights were getting worse and worse. I never saw anything other than shadows messing with my eyes. I was nearly always filled with unease and intense fear. Fear in the woods, even at night, is new for me. We all get a little spooked in the thick of the wilderness in pure darkness, but compared to my home, this wasn't even a wilderness. The snapping of branches and pine needles crunching underfoot haunted my every night. The screeching owls loved to chime in right at the height of anxiety. My nights were spent peering into the pine, watching, always waiting for whatever evil to present itself. I knew it was out there and it wanted me to know it too. One night my wife and I returned home to having the worst feeling I've ever felt. Every second driving up the long dirt road increased my anxiety tenfold. Something bad was ahead, and it was clear. The thick fog shrouded the pines. If it wasn't for the glimmer of the full moon, it would have been pitch black. Everything looked different, although it was right where we left it. Nothing seemed in place. Looking around, I suddenly see this orange, long-haired, mange cat sitting on a stump. This cat's eyes were so intense, fiery, almost glowing, but not quite. That cat, in my mind, was the embodiment of pure evil. I saw darkness in its soul. We start hearing branches snapping, pine needles crunching, seemingly from every direction. The brush was swaying back and forth, clearly indicating something was running within. Here I am, still staring at this cat, almost frozen in fear. Suddenly a voice breaks out, echoing throughout the forest. Hello, is anyone out here? A little girl, I thought. 
but something was off. My gaze finally breaks with the cat, and my eyes dart towards the road. My wife yells back, Hello? Are you okay? Anybody? The voice had changed. Help, help me! It was the same person or thing yelling, but as if it was trying to disguise its voice. We yell back several times without response. Somebody have helped me. The most intense, shrieking, evil-sounding voice of a woman had cut deep into my body. I'm filled with more intense fear than I can ever describe. But my wife, she is overcome with the need to find this person, and she started to head off into the forest without a word. I grabbed her by the arm and tell her something isn't right. Why won't she respond to us? She tries to break free from me to go off alone. I tell her to get into the truck and I'll grab the spotlights. We aren't going on foot. We roll the windows down and shine my intensely bright LED lights throughout the forest. We slowly creep down the road, yelling back. As we get further down the road, the voice strikes out, Please, won't anyone fusking help? Sounds are difficult to pin down in the woods. But this one was very close. I hit the brakes and stop immediately. We shine the lights and yell back, searching. No sign of anyone when suddenly the voice explodes into the cabin of the vehicle as if they were standing right outside my window. Help me. Somebody help. Leaving my ears hurting and ringing, I hit the gas and didn't look back. Called the police when I hit the highway and afterwards they said there was no one around. I picked up our stuff the next day, and my wife gave birth the following day. We never stayed there again after the baby was born. What the hell could do these things? I never even believed in paranormal things before, but I don't know what else happened. Edit. We had all been blood tested while living there, as well as no toxic metal levels on either autopsy reports. As simple as it seems, nobody had any poisoning whatsoever. In 1953, the encounter I'd like to share is not my own, but that of my mother. She used to tell me stories when I was young about strange things she had experienced in her lifetime. I remembered this dog, man type of encounter, while listening to many dogman shows on YouTube. There's not particularly a lot of detail to this encounter, but what you might find interesting is the location. The sighting took place in Sacramento, California, about 1953, not too far from our state's capital. Using Google Maps to get an approximate location and lay of the land, I could see the sighting area was about a thousand feet to the west and perpendicular to the American River. Across the river from the east bank, it's only about another two thousand feet east to the state capital. So this took place fairly close to a heavily populated area. My mother states that when she was about 12 years old, she was lying on the couch watching television. That's when she noticed a scary dog face looking at her through a low-pane window. The window was either on or by the door. I am unclear on this fact. In any event, she said the head must have been about two to two and uh, half feet above the ground. She covered her face in fright with her pillow. After a minute or so, she snuck a peek, figuring she must be imagining things. The face she saw was gone, and she felt a little better. Then she noticed it was now looking through another higher window. Its head was about four to four, and a half feet above the ground, according to her recollection. There was nothing outside that window for a dog to stand on, and at that point, she just ran to another room in terror. She doesn't really recall what happened after that. She describes the animal as being dark gray with glowing red eyes, seemingly panting or baring its teeth. She didn't see the body, but had the impression that it was thin. Unfortunately, she doesn't recall the time of day, month, or season. My parents tell me there's likely some American Indian burial grounds in the area, as there had been excavations near the river, which yielded Native American arrowheads and other artifacts. I even asked my mother if there were cornfields around the area since that has been mentioned in past encounters. She said only the small patch of corn stalks in their backyard. I don't think that qualifies. The area around my grandparents' house was not really wooded. 
The neighborhood was mostly just large fields with a few horses and some cattle. The areas around the river are wooded now, though, and were probably a lot more so in 1950. Three than it is today. Another paranormal story about this area is that on a Monster Quest episode detailing the Mothman, someone supposedly was taking dusk or night shot pictures of the Tower Bridge in 2009 and happened to see a flying humanoid shape or something off the bridge. One year during deer season, my uncle went out on the general hunt. He hiked a few miles in the middle of the night to get to his spot. When he got there, he heard some soft moans and couldn't find where it was coming from, but then noticed something large high up in a tree. Since it was still dark, he disregarded it and walked to his tree stand and settled in for the morning. As the light grew, he started to get a better and better picture of what was up in the tree. To his horror, it was a slumped-over man. He quickly got freaked out and then noticed through his spotting scope that it was a dead hunter sitting in a tree stand. Turns out the guy died of a heart attack, and my uncle likely experienced his last moments of life, but didn't realize what was happening. My uncle always talked about how creepy it was being in the forest early, early morning, and going through that situation. We, my cousins and I, would always hear this story on Halloween. When I got older, I assumed it was something to spook us, but my dad confirmed it was true. My uncle has been hunting since he was a teenager. He's in his 50s now. He's not what some would call a manly man, but he's an outdoorsman through and through. A top-notch hunter and angler, and he's a dead eye with any firearm. He's won shooting competitions and once shot the strings off from balloons at varying distances, then shot the balloons as they floated away. This was at a FBI-sponsored public meet and greet after an agent bet him he couldn't do it. He used a new pistol the agency was showcasing. Be it a rifle, shotgun, pistol. Doesn't matter if he wants to shoot it. It gets shot. Anyways, five or so years ago, he's up by the Canadian or U.S. border with some friends. Lots of lakes up there and very thick forest. A number of the lakes are kept pristine by having a strict no, motor policy. You can't have a boat in the water with a motor attached. It's an area that requires a lot of manual work to hunt and fish. You carry everything on your back. No a TV is no pickup trucks, just miles and miles of forest and water. This is hunting, fishing, and camping in the remotest sense. Him and his friends canoe across a lake and portage a while. Cross another lake, portage a while longer, looking for a good place to begin their hunt. After some hours of getting completely engulfed by nature, they come to an area that seems good for setting up camp. The nearest civilization is days away on foot. They are in the proverbial middle of nowhere, which is perfect for the kind of trip these guys had planned. They set up camp and begin their hunt. The plan was to go off in different directions and prospect the area, meet back at camp by nightfall and discuss the plan for tracking the next morning. The men all pick a direction and begin prospecting into the woods alone. At this point, my uncle is a couple of hours into his prospect. So for those of you keeping score, my uncle has entered a remote forest, canoed and portaged for half a day further into the woods, and is now on his own after having hiked even further into the woods. He is as secluded as a person can get. At some point in his hike, my uncle feels uneasy. He's not sure why, but something is starting to make him feel on edge. He has all of his firearms holstered at this point. He continues on his hike, taking notes of the area to share with his friends back at camp. He's busy jotting notes down when he suddenly gets a massive pang of anxiety. Fear begins taking over his faculties, and he has no idea why. He starts surveying his immediate surroundings and sees something in the distance. Something oddly out of place. He is now holding his pistol. He moves toward the object slowly and unsure. 
As he does, he realizes there isn't a single thing making a sound in the woods but him. All of the birds have gone absolutely quiet. He gets close enough to the object to see what it is. A medium-sized Coleman cooler and what looks to be brand new. The juxtaposition of this brightly colored man-made cooler in the absolute seclusion of its surroundings has my uncle confused to no end. But there it is. Set in the middle of nowhere with nothing. Or no one around for days. A perfectly new cooler. It's at this point in the story my uncle swears he had absolutely no inclination to open the cooler. In fact, everything in his being was telling him to leave it alone and get back to camp, as if the forest itself were warning him to turn around. He has now traded his pistol for his shotgun and has immediately began hiking back to camp. He says after about five minutes of hiking, he began to feel better, and after about seven to ten minutes, he noticed the birds chirping. He made it back to camp within 45 minutes to an hour. He sat around camp waiting for the others to return and shared with them what happened. His friends wanted to find the cooler the next day, but my uncle refused to go looking for it. The rest of their trip was pleasant, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. The first time my uncle shared this story was with me and my dad a few days after he got back from his trip. He was visibly upset while talking about it and became short with me when I gave him a hard time for not looking inside the cooler. He has no speculation as to where it came from, what was in it, or why it was there. He just knew, somehow, it was no good. The brother I, Law and myself out doing some night fishing for catfish, was around in the summer or beginning of fall in upstate New York. We were down a pretty steep bank that had a landing pad type formation at the bottom. We had been getting subtle rigs from the bells. Yes, bells. They clip onto your rod and ring when a fish hits or takes the bait. No fish, though. After about an hour, we started hearing crunching leaves up over the steep bank. We kept flashing our lights up there but could not see anything. We had a propane lantern for ambient light and headlamps for spotting or tying knots, etc. Over the course of the next three hours, we would hear something walking on the top of the bank. Never saw a thing. Kept going back and forth about the uneasy feeling we kept getting. Talked ourselves into thinking it was a coyote. Not many big predators where I live. Coyotes being the main concern, usually, so we don't bring self-defense weapons. Well, we got skunked and caught nothing. Packed up all our gear and loaded it in the truck. I lit a cigarette and we were talking about the noises we kept hearing. We looked around the truck in the foliage. Nothing. Finished my smoke and we got in the truck. I started it up and flicked my headlights on. Boom! Right there in front of the truck, staring into the lights. Puma! They don't natively live in New York. Uh, apparently they migrate through. Needless to say, I just drove away shaking the whole way home. Now we bring some form of self-defense, no matter what we are fishing for or where, where we're going. The fact that this thing was circling is for hours, stalking us. Freaky. It had the high ground as well, so it had pounced. I have no doubt one of us would be seriously hurt if not dead. Freaky man. My sighting occurred sometime in the winter of 1992, when I was 10 years old. I have always been an insomniac and would often be up in the middle of the night. This was the case on the night in question. I was in my bedroom looking out the window on the ground, floor of my childhood home. I looked across the street and my eyes landing on something that paralyzed me, me, with fascination. Leaning against the big tree in my neighbor's yard was a massive gray bipedal dog or wolf with huge muscular arms sniffing the air. He was just standing there sniffing the air. The image has been burned into my mind ever since. The way the steam of his breath swirled out of his nose as he craned his neck from side to side. The way the snow stuck to his gray bristling fur and the way his ears twitched. At first I told myself that it was just a big dog leaning on a tree, 
I couldn't accept what my brain was screaming to me. There was this crazy feeling I had. I don't know how to explain it. I still feel it when I think or talk about it. It deeply disturbed me, and I swear it knew I was watching it through the edge of my curtain. I don't know how I know that. I just do. It never looked directly at me. It had sort of glanced in the direction of my house. But I swear it knew I was watching. It didn't seem to mind. It seemed to be pleased with the, the strange mixture of sinking fear, confusion, denial, and awe that I was experiencing. Again, I don't know how I know that. I just do. What happened next dispelled all my denial. It sort of swung itself off the tree, and instead of dropping down to all fours as one would expect of a huge dog, it remained standing on its two legs, slightly hunched, and began to walk through the deep snow in the most unnatural way. I don't even know how to describe it other than unnatural. It was just so wrong. The way it walked, for some reason, was the most terrifying aspect of this whole encounter to me. It just sort of lumbered off behind the houses across the street and out of sight. I didn't speak of this encounter for nearly 20 years after it happened. I'd never heard anyone else speak of it locally in Ironwood, or anywhere else for that matter, and just talked it up to another one of the absolutely insane things I've seen in my life that I never speak of and make me question my sanity. Then one night, while listening to Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis, he was talking about the Michigan dogman. My head almost exploded. I couldn't believe it. Other people had seen this thing. I finally broke my silence and told my wife about it. It was sort of an epiphany I had in that moment. I no longer kept my strange experiences to myself anymore. I told everyone who I felt would be even slightly receptive to the idea of the paranormal about them. In my mind, I imagined how long I kept these strange secrets to myself for fear of being seen as a lunatic and how even I thought I was probably insane and wondered how many other people are out there walking around with similar experiences and similar self-doubt, just waiting for someone to come along and share the strange tale that allows them to give themselves permission to speak freely about the things they have kept locked inside as I had. It's shocking how many people, once you tell them a story like this, have a story of some high strangeness of their own. I'm so happy that this site exists, and people like you are out there telling these strange stories and giving people the opening they need to re-examine the strangeness of their lives and the world in which they live them. It was September in central Idaho. Autumn had come to the mountains and with it, bow hunters looking for mountain goats. My cousin, let's call him Vern, for anonymity's sake, is an avid hunter. He's been all over North America hunting various game. Bears in Alaska, wild hogs in Texas, bighorn sheep in Wyoming, but his favorite hunting area was the Lim High Mountain Range in central Idaho. Our extended family has been hunting in those mountains for generations. We know every river bottom and mountain peak like many people know their own neighborhood. Mountain goats are a fascinating animal to hunt. They live well above the tree line in rocky environments. They are sure-footed and can climb near vertical slopes. Hunting these animals requires one to venture into these dangerous areas. You have to be mindful as you pursue an animal like that. One wrong step on a rocky slope or one loose rock could mean you're not going home ever again. Vern was an expert mountain hunter. It's something he was born to do. Vern decided to hunt in the Hayden River area of the Lemmys. It's a familiar spot to most locals, and the area is home to plenty of mountain goats. The first mile of Vern's hike was uneventful as he climbed up the canyon. The air was crisp and his breath formed in great plumes as he progressed. The sun was just peeking over the mountains when Vern came to a small deer trail. He decided it might be a nice shortcut from his usual route and took it. A few hundred feet up the trail, he saw something odd pop out from behind a tree. It was a man. He was dressed in a light denim coat and jeans and was carrying a small backpack. My cousin stopped for a second to get his bearings, unsure of where this guy came from. 
The man waved at him with both arms. One of them was holding an older-style hunting bow. Acknowledging him, Vern waved back. Although the man looked to be physically fine, it was clear he was emotionally distressed. He yelled out something my cousin couldn't quite hear and waved his arm, indicating my cousin should follow him. Vern didn't get any bad vibes from this man and could tell he was genuinely in need of some help. He began to make his way up the canyon following this mystery man. Byrne could never gain any ground on this guy. He was always just far enough away that he couldn't talk to him. Periodically, the man would stop, turn towards him to make sure Vern was still following. Every time he looked back, Vern could see the worry in his face. My cousin did his best to remain calm and keep a smile on his face, unsure who or what he was being led to. It was peculiar, Vern thought, as he hiked. He hadn't seen any other vehicles on his drive up to the trailhead. Perhaps he came in from over another ridge. What could he possibly be leading him to? He figured one of his hunting party had been hurt and needed help. Of course, he wouldn't have had to speculate if the man would just stop and talk to him for five minutes. Vern lost sight of the guy just past a turn in the trail. The trail opened up into an incredibly steep, rocky, talus slope. He looked in every direction and could not locate the man when he heard a whistle. Looking up, he saw the guy about 500 feet up the rocky slope, waving at him. There was no possible way he could have gotten up that far in just the short time Vern lost sight of him. He still didn't feel any fear or weariness about this weird situation. The man was waving more frantically now practically begging Vern to follow him up the slope. With a sigh and a grunt, he started up the rocks. It was slow going. Every other step caused a mini rock slide and would cause him to continually lose his footing. Huffing and puffing on the cool, thin air, my cousin eventually made it to a small landing. It had taken him almost 45 minutes to get to that spot where he saw the man from below. There was no earthly way anyone could have done that scramble uphill any faster. Totally exhausted and out of breath, Vern sat down on the stone landing. He looked around and couldn't see the man anywhere. As he scanned his surroundings, he saw something odd poking out of a boulder about twenty feet away from him. Walking over to it, he found a weathered boot. Two boots, actually. Inside those boots and under the boulder as well were bones. Vern looked around once again for the man, but he never saw him again. Instead of feeling eerie or unnerving, Vern felt a sense of relief wash over him. These emotions weren't his own. What he felt seemed to come from all around him. He marked the spot with his GPS and decided to make his way down and call the authorities. The Lemhi County Sheriff's Office responded, and he led them up the canyon to the body. It took four grown men to push the boulder out of the way. And when they did, they found the skeletonized remains of a man. On the body, they found hunting equipment and some personal effects. From a credit card in the wallet, they were able to identify the man. He was a bow hunter that had gone missing almost exactly 50, three years beforehand. Vern never wanted to be identified to the public or the missing hunter's family. He didn't want recognition for something like that. To him, it was just one of those bizarre mountain stories. He was happy that the family got closure, even if it was half a century later. The only thing that bothered him was the man leading him up the canyon, and with his strange and sudden disappearance. He had mentioned the waving man to the sheriff, but was brushed off. When news reports came out announcing the discoveries, several photos of the man were published. Vern was absolutely shocked when he saw them. In the photos was the man he had seen leading him up the mountain to the body. It finally made sense to him, the man's distressful look. The constant checking if Vern was following him. The sense of relief he felt when the body was discovered. That man was desperate to get home. And through Vern, he was able to be reunited with his family. My wife, Sarah, and I shared a peculiar hobby. We were avid enthusiasts of Bigfoot hunting. Our weekends were often spent in the dense woods, chasing the elusive creature that many believed to be a myth. 
On one particular outing with our fellow enthusiasts, the Tri-State Squatchers, little did we know that our quest would lead us to an encounter beyond our wildest imagination. The night was thick with the darkness of the forest, the only source of light coming from our flashlights and the occasional glow of the moon filtering through the treetops. We roamed silently, our senses heightened, searching for any signs of the elusive creature, the air was crisp, and the rustling of leaves beneath our boots was the only sound that dared to disturb the stillness. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the anticipation hung heavy in the air. Suddenly, a glint of reflective light caught my eye. Sarah and I exchanged excited glances as we realized we might be onto something. We approached cautiously, our flashlights cutting through the shadows. The gleaming eyes in the darkness stared back at us, sending shivers down our spines. I shine, a classic sign of wild life, but this was different. It was almost other world life, brimming with excitement. I decided to investigate further, cautiously moving towards the source. As I closed the distance, the woods around us seemed to hold its breath. Then, out of nowhere, a thunderous stomp echoed through the night. The ground quivered beneath us and the air filled with tension. I motioned for the rest of the group to stay put as I scanned the area with my camera and spotlight. In the eerie glow of the spotlight, I saw nothing at first. The silence persisted until I played back the footage on my camera. There on the screen was an image that sent shockwaves through the group, the unmistakable form of a dogman, a creature from folklore, captured in the fleeting seconds of that large stomp. Chris Randolph, our group leader, and the rest of the Tri-State Squatchers gathered around the camera in disbelief. The dogman's hulking figure, half-human, half-kind, stared back at us from the screen, frozen in a moment that would forever alter our perception of the forest secrets. The encounter with the dogman became the talk of the town, and our little group gained unexpected notoriety. As the news spread, so did the interest of curious individuals and skeptics alike. Chris Randolph and the Tri-State Squatchers found themselves thrust into the lamplight, their passion for the unknown taking on a new level of significance. Our journey into the woods that night not only provided us with evidence of the dogman's existence, but also ignited a flame of curiosity that burned brighter than ever. The mystery of the forest deepened, and our adventures with the Tri-State Squatchers continued, forever bound by the enigmatic encounter with the creature that lurked in the shadows. This sighting happened three years ago. I just discovered this subreddit a few days ago, and now feel compelled to tell this story because it was completely unlike anything I've ever seen. It was a cold night in late November in Boulder, Colorado, and me and a few friends were just driving around smoking and drinking beers. We had driven aimlessly back and forth around town, just talking and enjoying ourselves, I remember prior to this I had read stories and watched videos of native elders discussing the Wendigo and had interest in the subject. I remember my friend's girlfriend, who we were with at the time, was Native American, and I asked her if she'd heard of the Wendigo, and she said yes. We continued to aimlessly drive up the mountain past a place known as Flagstaff up on the flat irons of Boulder. It was a deep, dark, wooded area far from the city that by day looks absolutely beautiful, but by night has a very eerie and spooky feel to it. I've been dozens of times at night, and every time I have felt a deep intuition that something evil lurks around that area, especially in winter, this is a feeling I've had long before I knew of the Wendigo or believed in anything supernatural or spiritual. In fact, I've seen orange lights on the Flagstaff Mountains and above. The Flagstaff Mountains many times, and have also heard stories of orange bell-shaped lights floating around the area. We stopped at a common hiking spot in the parking spaces right in front of the trailhead, and all of a sudden I felt a surreal feeling of darkness. It felt as though something wasn't right, and there was a deep feeling of mystery about the spot we were at. 
All my friends were talking, and for some reason I began to zone out looking deep into the pines. I was staring deep into the forest, and I could see in the moonlight little kids running back and forth, hiding behind trees. Immediately I knew what I was seeing was something demonic. Kids wouldn't be out at 3 a.m. in winter in the woods, and the way they were, just darting back and forth looked unnatural. At this point I felt almost hypnotized and kind of shook, but more intrigued than anything. These kids began to start running in a circle, and a kind of blurry mist started forming. Out of this mist, a classic wendigo started forming. A slender white figure with its jaw gaping open unnaturally and its long hands moving up and down, doing a kind of dance while just staring at me. Both the kids and the wendigo looked like they were fading in and out of physical reality like spirits. At the time, I'd never heard of the black-eyed children, but now I suspect that's what those kids were. I mentioned what I was seeing to my friends, and they thought I was trying to F with them, and both the Wendigo and kids quickly were gone out of sight. It was pretty bizarre. I remember to this day the level of detail was insane, so I know it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me. At a young age, experiences which I have now come to suspect as being abduction experiences occurred with terrifying frequency. For many decades, I was convinced they were nothing more than a recurring nightmare, but now I am not so sure. The best that I can tell, it first began in 1976, 8-7, when I was living in Chateau Gray, Quebec, Canada. The experience begins after I'm put to bed, despite my protests that leaving me alone in my bedroom would result in harm to me by unknown entities. Shortly after being put to bed, the red eyes would appear right outside of my bedroom window. They seemed to hang there, though I was never once able to make out any physical body that housed these terrifying eyes. Though I have memories of these eyes communicating with me despite their lack of a mouth, Sometimes they would be reassuring. Other times they were terrifying in their cold calculatedness. I would always fight the desire to sleep because I somehow knew that the eyes were waiting for me to fall asleep before they would be able to interfere with me. I was never once able to avoid falling asleep, though I tried valiantly. Inevitably, my eyelids would begin to droop, and before long, I was being carried in the arms of a Sasquatch like being whose arms and legs were covered in thick black fur. I do not recall being able to discern any facial features of the creature as every time I tried to make eye contact, it was as if my mind blurred out the terrifying face. I should have been able to see. I also do not remember there being any foul stench as normally associated with Sasquatch. I would then be carried out of my bedroom and down the stairs to the landing on the main floor where the kitchen, the living room, and the hallway which leads to the front door meet. Once there, I am frantically looking around as I am screaming in terror for someone, anyone to save me, though I distinctly remember not being able to get away from the beast, no matter how I tried. I was able, however, to gain a fairly good peripheral view of my surroundings. I noted that the entire family was seated in the living room in the middle of the night and in various stages of undress, and they seemed to be playing cards. This led me to believe that they were engaged in a game of strip poker. Every member of that staunchly Catholic and severely sexually repressed family was seated there half naked or more and fully engaged in a game of cards from my grandmother right to my six-year-old sister. All were slowly stripping down, garment by garment. All were oblivious to what was happening to me as they focused intently on their card game. I screamed and screamed, but no one gave even the slightest indication that they could even hear me, much less respond. Then the beast turned right to exit the front door. This is where it varies on occasion. Sometimes it ends abruptly with the opening of the screen door, in others it ends with me being handed off to something I could not see, which carried me up the ladder into some sort of craft, which I also could not see. 
It felt as though my body was being fully supported at all pressure points by an unseen force. Later on, as these experiences continued, I remember being whisked into a blindingly white room onto a bed. I do not remember the facial features of the beings in that room with me, as I was never able to see any faces clearly. It was like they were always blurred out. I could see every other detail perfectly, but never their faces. I remember them taking something out of my head through my right nostril. They only did this once that I recall. I remember waking up the next morning with an unexplained nosebleed. Nosebleeds are not something I have ever had before nor since. When I was 13 years old, my mother and her husband bought a huge house near Anderson, Indiana. It was built in the 1870s on an area said to be sacred to the Native Americans who had formerly lived there. It had a pool, tennis court, and a small grove of trees, but it had been vacant for several years and was in need of repair. Through research, I discovered that the house had been owned by a very old woman and her husband. Previous to them, it was owned by the woman's family who had been wealthy. The woman had died in the house in the large master bedroom, and her husband had died in an unknown accident. There were old servant quarters, which was now an apartment and had been occupied by a man by the name of Sam. He informed us that the couple was buried in the grove because they loved it there while they were alive. After we moved in, my mom and I would sit in the sunroom. At times, we would smell a strong scent of sickening perfume. We looked all around, but couldn't tell where it was coming from. A few weeks later, I began to notice more strange activity. My room was on the end of a long hallway in which you had to cross through another room to get to. The rooms were separated by large French doors. My bed was facing towards the door so I could look into the other room. At night, I would hear heavy footsteps walking up and down the stairs and through the hallway. One night, I heard the footsteps coming in my direction from the other room and suddenly stopped. I could hear a faint and steady breathing noise. I just hide under my covers and cried myself to sleep. I told my mother, but she simply told me I was imaging it, even though she later admitted that she had heard footsteps. A year or so later, I was on summer vacation. My mother would leave me home alone sometimes so she could go and run errands. Occasionally, I witnessed black shadows out of the corner of my eye when I was watching TV in the living room, but when I would turn to look, it would be gone. Once, when I was completely alone in the house, I heard something moving around upstairs. I muted the TV and heard a loud, heavy thumping and then footsteps moving quickly back and forth through the hallway in the master bedroom. Later, just before my mother and her husband divorced and we moved out, I had a few friends over. We went into the basement, which had an old coal furnace and several other large rooms. My friends and I were pretty curious about the coal furnace. So we opened it up and found a bunch of old newspapers, chicken bones, and a vintage amulet. It was obvious that it was made of sterling silver and had a large amethyst mounted on it. I removed it from the furnace, cleaned it up, took it to my room, and laid it on my nightstand. Later, I told my mother what I'd found, and she said that I could keep it. That night, I again heard footsteps coming into my room, but this time there was distinct crying and sobbing sounds. I was terrified and covered my head with a quilt. After a few minutes, the crying stopped and I pulled back the covers. Then I noticed that the amulet was gone. I looked all over, but never found it. Several years later, I was working on a school project that involved local history. My mother and I still lived in the same area, though we now lived in a new, smaller house. I was in the library looking through old photographs when I stumbled onto several old post-mortem images. Immediately, I recognized the name of the woman who had lived in the old house, previous to U.S., who was buried in the grove. The photo was of her during the wake, and around her neck was the exact amulet I had found in the furnace. I never have understood how the amulet got into the furnace, but I'm willing to bet it's around her neck.
The first UFOs I saw, my son ran inside and said emphatically, Dad, get out here now. So I jumped out of my chair and went out our south door where he was standing. Two orbs not, but fifty feet away were not moving, about two feet off my driveway. So I turned and yelled at my wife that there were UFOs in our drive. We are on a farm not too far from the crash in the early forties in Cape Girardeau. Well, she did come out, and I went to grab the camera, but of course it wasn't there, so I grabbed the binoculars. So the three of us were on the porch just staring at them. The sun just set to the west, and we were looking south. I was looking through the binoculars so close I could only see parts of the orbs at a time. I was looking for anything man-made, no doors or windows, just both levitating by each other. So my stupid idea was to start walking to them. I got to about 20 to 25 feet from them before they started to rise in unison up over the tall tree line and into the neighbor's gully out of sight. I stayed there for what seemed to be a long time, but they never came out. They both looked identical, like looking at the sun, but a little more orangish, but very bright. This was on October 12, 2012 at 7.30 p.m. People from all walks of life see them from the police, firefighters, our mailmen, and so on. Also on our major news channel, they put up a fake UFO. You can find people's pictures and videos if you search UFOs in Cape Girardeau and Jackson, Missouri summer of 2012. I started to get premonitions, then my health got so bad I was in the ICU for over five months, completely paralyzed. And still, to this day, I'm recovering. Do you know the last official act of John F. Kennedy as President of the United States? The day before, he was assassinated in Dallas Kennedy, dedicated six new aerospace medical research buildings at Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. There were rumors that JFK may have seen the alien bodies retrieved from the UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. It is said that another former United States president took TV variety, star Jackie Gleason, an avid UFO fan, out to Homestead Air Force Base to show him alien bodies on ice. It makes you wonder just how many of our presidents have viewed these alien cadavers. While at Brooks Air Force Base, President Kennedy met Major General Theodore C. Bedwell, Jr., who had served as Deputy Surgeon and Chief of Industrial Medicine at Wright Field in Ohio, the location where the Roswell cadavers had been taken following their retrieval in 1947. A colleague of Major General Bedwell, Jr., claims to have read a classified report that included several color photographs of a highly unusual humanoid body, recovered by NASA security personnel at what is known today as the John H. Glenn Research Center at Lewis Field, Ohio. This was where liquid hydrogen rocket engines were developed that enabled NASA's Apollo astronauts to reach the moon. Two nights before the body was taken, there had been a wave of UFO activity in the woods surrounding the Glenn facility that resembled small, fast-moving balls of blue light darting and zigzagging around the NASA installation. Interestingly, this was similar to the UFO activity described to me by Tom Burnett, co-author of Bigfoot, exploring the myth and discovering the truth. Burnett had observed similar UFO activity near his home in the Cherokee Mountains of North Carolina. Tom claims Bigfoot, like creatures are all over the Smoky Mountains, but unlike his mountain neighbors who moved after experiencing frightening encounters with these mountain monsters, he is determined not to let them run him off his property. Once Tom Burnett had rented his mountain cabin to a couple who, only after a couple of nights, called him from a store in town requesting their deposit back after being frightened by the sound of helicopter blades in the sight of bright lights in the woods in the middle of the night. The creature that had been shot and killed by NASA security near the John H. Glenn Research Center was described as an immense, approximately nine-foot-tall, powerfully, 
muscled monster that matches the description of Bigfoot. The beast was allegedly autopsied and found to have 32 teeth like most humans, vocal cords resembling those of humans, and even stranger was the small metallic device found embedded within its lower left arm that resembled a highly advanced tracking device or transmitter. Eventually, the remains of the creature, including the transmitter, were taken to the Foreign Technology Division of Wright, Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Nothing else is known regarding the incident. Dear Theodore, I am the monster hiding under your bed. Personally, I think monster is a bit of a harsh word, but that's what you call me, so that's what I choose to go by. To make it clearer, though, I go by many names beyond you. Night Stalker is one. The Shadow Man is another. I think I also may have accidentally started a few legends without meaning to. Would you believe that Bigfoot or Slenderman may have just been me taking a stroll through the woods? Truly, depending on who sees me, any human can imagine something different. So far, I like your imagination the best. As I'm writing this, you're six years old. For all six, I've been under your bed. I followed you from the NICU and listened to your crying all the way home from the hospital. I admit that the crib was harder to squeeze myself under. But I managed. I'm grateful you've since upgraded to a big boy bed. It's a lot easier on my back. As you've grown, you leave the house more and more. I'd forgotten that children go to school so young until I heard you return, excitedly rambling to your ignorant parents about the things you'd learned. Mrs. Thomas sounds nice from what you say. I approve of her, for now. Anyone can sound nice coming from you, though, because you tend to see the best in people. It's a quality that gives me hope. This world needs more people with infinite optimism like yours. And you can quote the big scary night monster on that. In fact, you even try to find good things in me. When the moon casts a hideous mix of shadows and light into your room, and the fear of my very presence makes you tremble, I hear you whisper to me. I'm scared. Are you scared too? It's clear that you don't know who you're talking to. To you, I am nothing but a nameless creature with no aim or purpose, just an undetermined maliciousness. You don't even seem to know what I would hypothetically do to you, should you fall asleep while I'm around. In the daytime, you think you're safe from me. Do you think shadows simply disappear, little one? If I wanted to hurt you, I would. You drew me once when you were four. The crumpled paper ended up under the bed with me. You've never truly seen me, and your art skills were underdeveloped to say the least, so of course there were a few inconsistencies. Your illustration depicted a haphazard gray scribble with pointed teeth and horns and too many claws to count, almost like a sickly demonic porcupine. I couldn't help but be amused when I saw it. I won't say you were completely wrong. I suppose I mention all this because I know that you know nothing about me, but I know so, so much about you. In fact, I'd like to think that I know you better than you know yourself. I know that you don't like vegetables, but will eat any fruit placed in front of you. I know that your favorite cereal is Reese's Puffs, even though you rarely get to eat them. I know that you only know one curse word, but you're afraid to say it out loud. I know that you want to be a firefighter, but two months ago, you wanted to be a construction worker, and you will end up being neither. I know the names of all your friends, and which ones will turn out to betray you in the future. I know the names of your first and second girlfriends, and your first and only boyfriend. I know you love your parents, even though they hurt you. I know the age at which you'll die. I also know how to stop it. Though I do know a lot of things, I'm not sure when this letter will reach you. In fact, I'm not sure you will ever read it. I wish I could say that I was positive you'd understand why I'm about to do what I plan to, and that you'd support my decision when you grow older. But the truth is, I don't know if you ever will. 
The only thing I'm 100% clear on is that I won't regret doing what I'll do to them. They deserve the punishment they'll receive. Because at night, when the tree branches look like giant claws at your window and the darkness seems to be moving in closer, I know it's not me you're truly afraid of. Deep inside, in a place your mind cannot yet access, you're afraid of your parent. I'm scared. Are you scared too? You ask the question not over the sounds of me, but over them. They fight and spat like wild animals. A never-ending cyclone of neglect and anger. You have no idea how they act when you're gone, flourishing in the temporary safety that a classroom brings you. You cannot yet fathom the amount of pain they will bring you when they realize you become too old to coddle and just old enough to treat you like they treat each other. You would be so good without them, Theodore. Much better off, I assure you. It'll hurt for a while, sure. But you're still so young. The pain will fade, and then you'll be free. Free from their chaos and self-destruction and abuse. You'll be able to live the life you want, with no one to hold you back. One day, if you read this, you'll understand why I took them away from you. And I hope then that you'll thank me. I hope the nightmares of your parents' blood will slowly fade into a background hum, replaced by that endless optimism I know you hold so close. And when that day comes, I hope you realize that I care for you more than they ever did. Eternally yours, the monster still under your bed. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.